Great. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for making the trip out here this morning. Can you hear me okay in the back? Awesome. Great. We have some really great sound and tech guys today, so hopefully everything runs really smoothly, but if you have any issues, let me know. I have just turned down the heat so that you all stay awake, because I know that it's fascinating content and you want to be here, but, you know, no napping. <laughs> There's a really nice lobby for that. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sarah Sherman. I'm a project coordinator at NB Lung, and I've connected with a lot of you as part of preparing for today and organizing the workshop. So we'd like to start by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional or ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We also acknowledge that people of African descent have been in Nova Scotia over 400 years, and we honor and offer gratitude to those ancestors of African descent who came before us to this land. We're deeply grateful to our sponsors uh, and donors of their unwavering patronage of what we do. Without them, our work wouldn't be possible. And so thank you for all fostering a brighter and healthier future of Atlantic Canada. Today has been sponsored through financial contributions from Health Canada, for which we are very appreciative. So um, that's Dusty. He's going to be kind of running our Zoom. Jordan, who's running the main thing here and keeping it all smooth and fabulous. They've been really great to work with. Um, I'd like to introduce Melanie Langeal, our CEO. She's at the back there, so if you haven't met Melanie. And we have Elise out front who's been registering people in. So um, without that, with that, are we ready with Dr. Malott on the Zoom there, guys? Yes? OK. So I would like to introduce Dr. John Malott of the Environmental Health Association of Quebec. His topic today is air pollution as a modifiable risk factor for chronic disease. Dr. John Malott began his focused medical practice on environmental health in Ottawa in the 1980s and has been a staff physician at the Environmental Health Clinic at Women's College Hospital in Toronto since 2007. He's an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Presently, he is a member of the Canadian Committee on Indoor Air Quality and Medical Advisor for Canadians for Properly Built Homes and the Environmental Health Associations of Quebec and Canada. He has recently published peer-reviewed articles on MCS titled Neurological Susceptibility to Environmental Exposures, Pathophysiological Mechanisms in Neurodegeneration and Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, and multiple chemical sensitivity. It's time to catch up to the science. And Dr. Malat has also authored a book called 12,000 Canaries Can't Be Wrong. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. John Malat. OK. Um, so let's get started. So how's it going on the part of the planet where you live? I heard you had a storm. I'm asking because global warming is a fact and climate change is a result. Depending on where you live, your part of the world may now be more frequently on fire or the air is contaminated by toxic smoke. This is a picture of a cloudless sunny day in suburban Ottawa during the northeastern Ontario and western Quebec forest fires last June. And this is an image of our American friends thanking us for coloring their air in apocalyptic orange. Maybe you live in an area where the land is completely dried out, like in the prairie provinces or California or Africa, or maybe you live in Canada's north where the planet is melting. Are you enduring more major storms that are larger and more powerful than they used to be? Are you dealing with the resulting damage or floods? Are you a healthcare professional? Concerned about the increased prevalence of heat-related illnesses because your heat waves are more frequent and lasting longer. The burning of fossil fuels for energy, for transportation and industry is the major culprit for all these changes because they're increasing the greenhouse effect that keeps our planet warm. Our planet is heated by the sun, infrared radiation, which bounces off back into space. But greenhouse gases are naturally present in the atmosphere. Working like a greenhouse, they absorb and re-emit the sun's radiation. In the greenhouse gases, the earth would be on average about 33 degrees centigrade colder. Concentrations of major greenhouse gases are at their highest levels 
for at least the past 800,000 years. And fossil fuel combustion is the major reason why. These emissions are driving climate change. They're also the most significant source for outdoor air pollution. Climate change impacts and increases air pollution exposures. For example, wildfire increased toxic particulate concentrations and heat increases the formation of ground level ozone, which is also toxic in a greenhouse gas. Earlier and longer springs and summers, warmer temperatures and precipitation changes can increase exposure to pollen and other airborne allergens such as mold spores. Furthermore, flooding can create a damp or water damaged indoor environment leading to the proliferation of mold and bacteria and more dust mites and indoor air contamination from the breakdown of building materials. Air pollution and climate change are deeply interconnected. The sources of local air pollution and emissions that drive climate change are shared. Both provide substantial risk to the population and each can exacerbate the effects of the other. What's environmental health? The World Health Organization defined environmental health as aspects of human health and diseases that are determined by environmental factors. It refers to the assessment and control of environmental factors that could potentially affect health. Environmental medicine is the clinical practice of environmental health. It's well known that we are understand by we're surrounded by hundreds or thousands of synthetic chemicals every day. To understand the significance of this, let's do a hypothetical experiment. Let's empty a thousand different medication capsules and make a mixture, and then put a small amount of it back into each capsule, and then swallow one of these capsules every day, even if you're pregnant, and give it to your children too. Anybody here want to volunteer to see what happens? Well, actually, this experiment has already started and you're one of the subjects. We are all contaminated. We know from human biomonitoring that everybody's contaminated with chemical pollutants. This image lists many chemicals commonly found in most people. Researchers are now collecting data to see what happens. We are immersed in a chemical soup. Whoops. From outdoor air pollution, indoor air pollution, chemicals in our diet, water, personal care products, and drugs. They hit on everyone. From unborn babies and children to middle-aged adults and the elderly. Some of these chemicals are hard to eliminate and they end up being dissolved in fat. We all have internal exposure sources too. We're continuously exposed to dynamic pollution exposures over our whole lifespan, from womb to tomb, which is a concept known as the exposome. The human body is not siloed. I don't know why this is here. It's made of and there we go. The human body is not silent, but instead continually interacts with and is changed by its environment. It's made of three trillion cells. There are many types, but they don't live in isolation. Their survival depends on re receiving and processing information and then changing their own internal workings in response. They communicate directly with one another via chemical messengers, such as hormones and neurotransmitters and they also need to read their external environment. Cells have receptors, which are like specific pockmarks on their surface to receive chemical messages from the other cells. This is how hormones and neurotransmitters function. Some of these receptors can detect foreign chemicals, and when they do, the cell's defense system is activated. Even low dose exposures to foreign chemicals can be perceived by early warning detection of receptor systems in cells. This system is ancient, hundreds of millions of years old, 
and it enabled single cells to survive well before the development of synthetic substances. It does so by sensing foreign chemicals, regulating the expression of detoxifying genes, and promoting detoxification before these chemicals can cause tissue damage. The impact of these chemical exposures is not just related to the level of dosage of exposures. It's also related to the ability to detoxify and eliminate these substances, which is still a fundamental and essential feature of defense mechanisms inherent in every cell. This is a simplified illustration of an effective, well-balanced detoxification system in which the intake of toxins is balanced by the antioxidants, which is why you need to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables because that's where our antioxidant supply comes from. Our ability to adequately detoxify is decreased when there's an increased burden from exposures or if we have deficient nutritional support because we don't need enough antioxidants or if you have an abnormal genotype, some of us are just better at detoxifying than others. And when this occurs, the effects of toxins is not offset by our antioxidants. And as a result, we start to damage cells and cause dysfunction. This damage, which we can measure, is called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is a fact of life. It's part of the aging process, and especially linked to frailty and loss of skeletal muscle mass and strength. Long living individuals display less oxidative stress and damage and it can be reduced by regular aerobic exercise. The degree of oxidative stress we experience is not static. It can fluctuate with changes in the environment and pollution, as well as metabolism and poor diet and lifestyle. It's induced by smoking alcohol. We're smoking and alcohol consumption substance abuse, and even exhausting exercises. It's observed in people who are overweight and obese or have complications such as insulin resistance, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. It's seen in seasonal allergies and asthma or chronic pain disorders like osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, and chronic migraine. It occurs with systemic inflammation and it occurs with psychological stress or mental disorders like anxiety. Chronic diseases are complex and their causes are usually multifactorial and they are often statistically and significantly co- or multimorbid, meaning that they often occur together because they share risk factors and mechanisms. One common denominator is oxidative stress, which contributes to the pathology of many common chronic diseases such as respiratory and cardiovascular diseases diabetes, neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders, and neuropsychiatric conditions, renal diseases, and cancer. Air pollution is associated with the development or exacerbations of many non-communicable diseases. It's also associated with the multimorbidity of these chronic diseases, and oxidative stress is considered a primary pathway. There are hundreds of papers which provide vigorous support for oxidative stress as the primary and critical underlying mechanism in the systemic toxicity associated with air pollution exposures. So let's look more closely at air pollution. Compared to rural air, urban air is more polluted, especially by the burning of fossil fuels, and 82% of Canadians live in an, an urban environment. The scientific evidence for adverse health effects from chronic exposures to very low concentrations of common air pollutants is robust, and no evidence exists for a safe threshold. The World Health Organization tells us that air pollution is a top five major risk factor for developing chronic non-communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurodegenerative disorders. These are the four risk factors you probably know about and which are reviewed by your healthcare practitioners. Tobacco use, unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, and harmful use of alcohol. They don't usually ask about your air pollution exposures. 
even though chronic diseases are associated with these long-term exposures. On the other hand, Canadians spend 90% of their time indoors. So how safe is that? One factor depends on how much the building envelopes filter the outdoor air. Ozone concentrations indoors vary between 20% and 80% of outdoor levels. The more occupants, the lower the level of ozone because it interacts with the oils or personal care products on our skin, which produces other potentially toxic chemical byproducts and that can contaminate the indoor environment. Approximately 65% of the levels of outdoor particulate matter at 2.5 microns, about the size of a small cell, can be found in the indoor environment. There's also ultrafine particulate matter, which is below 0.1 microns, or nanoparticle in size, the size of a virus, which is more poorly filtered by the building envelope, and thus becomes relatively higher in percentage indoors. These nanoparticles are already the most plentiful particulate matter outside and also the most toxic. Indoor air is actually worse than outdoors. The primary factors affecting the indoor air pollution environment, the indoor air environment are the outdoor air quality, human activity in the indoor environment, and the building and construction materials, furniture, and various types of indoor equipment, which are gas. Indoor air is more polluted with chemicals than the outdoor air. Chemicals called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, are two to five times higher in the indoor air than outdoors. Being volatile means that they evaporate in normal indoor temperature conditions, and organic means that they contain carbon. Most of these chemicals are easily and rapidly systemically absorbed from the lungs. They also passively diffuse through the blood-brain barrier into the brain and can produce central nervous system effects on a molecular level in as little as one or two minutes. Close to 50 different VOCs are found in more than 50% of Canadian homes, and they predominantly originate from indoor sources such as fragrances and scented products like personal care, cleaning and laundry products, scented candles, deodorizers and disinfectants. They off-gas from furnishings like furniture, carpets, adhesives, curtains, blinds and shades, and from building materials such as parquet, particle boards, oriented strand boards and plywood. The long-term outdoor pollution exposure studies demonstrating adverse health effects are confounded by the indoor environment because 90% of our exposure time to the outdoor pollutants being studied occurs indoors, where the indoor pollutants from outdoor sources are actually reduced compared to outside, but chemical exposures are increased from indoor sources. So how safe are VOCs? Over 300 chemical pollutants have been identified indoors and for the vast number of them, safe levels are unknown. Over 40% of those VOCs do not have available health standards. And for those that do, they're based on single exposures in occupational settings. Semi-volatile organic compounds do not have relevant indoor air health standards. They tend to partition between the gas and the solid phase and are bound to surfaces, including the particulate matter in the air. So we inhale more semi-volatile compounds than we realize if we only measure the amount in the gas phase. Most importantly, our world, real-world chemical exposures are fluctuating mixtures for which there are no standards at all. The chemical exposure limits we do have are not protective, they're calculated, and are not fine lines between safe and dangerous exposures. The influence of multiple exposures is usually additive or possibly even synergistic, and exposures in mixtures means that less of each one is required to cause damage, phenomenon known as mixture toxicity. Fragrances are volatile chemicals. Commercially, there are mixtures of different compounds intentionally put together to create a specific scent. Most are synthesized from petrochemicals. According to the International Fragrance Society, more than 3,200 
different fragrance materials are in use in a multitude of commonly used products. And these mixtures are proprietary, protected by law from disclosure. And thus they hide information about potential adverse health effects from uninformed consumers, preventing informed choice. Independent studies have identified 50 different VOCs in perfume. One study of 134 popular consumer products identified 338 different VOCs emitted from personal care products, air fresheners, cleaning supplies, laundry products, and sunscreens. They included both fragrance and fragrance-free labeled products, and some had claims of green. Fragrances include perfumes, aftershaves, colognes, shampoos, and conditioners, soaps, body lotions, and deodorants, which we apply to our skin. They're also found in laundry detergents and fabric softeners. They emit VOCs from your clothing and sheets and pillowcases. You lie in bed inhaling them all night long, and so do all your children. When we use these laundry products, they're vented to and contaminate the outdoor air. Many of these products use scent boosters to make the odors linger on fabrics even after washing. Fragrances are found in menstrual products, used 10,000 times over a lifespan, and they're in diapers and baby wipes. Some grandmothers with chemical sensitivity report being unable to hold their young grandchildren. Doors, oops. Flores VOCs react under sunlight with nitrogen oxides emitted from burning fossil fuels and industrial activities to form ozone, which contributes to global warming. It's quite noteworthy that improved vehicle emission standards have signified a significantly reduced VOC levels over the past 20 years. However, Indoor ventilation systems and dryer vents exhaust VOCs into the outdoor ambient air. VOCs from indoor exposures now contribute up to 80% of the outdoor VOCs, depending on population density, and they contribute to global warming. This is an image of your respiratory system. Take a slow, deep breath in through your nose and slowly exhale. Picture the air moving from your sinuses to your alveoli or air sacs and back. Unless you can detect an odor, you should feel nothing except for the expansion and contraction of your chest. You didn't feel the particulates or the gases and vapors, including the VOCs, but they were felt by the cells lining your bronchial tubes and tiny bronchioles and the 480 million alveoli packed into your lungs where the air exchange takes place. Your respiratory system is the primary interface between you and the polluted air. 12 to 18 breaths per minute, 20,000 breaths per day, about 7.5 million breaths each year. It's your first line of defense against air pollution. Some of the VOCs landed on the mucous membrane lining your respiratory tract, but those VOCs that reached the alve alveoli were likely absorbed into your circulation. Some of the particulates were exhaled but others landed on the lining of your respiratory tract, and some of the very tiny ones could penetrate down to the alveoli and were absorbed. If you weren't chemically sensitive, you felt nothing, but there was a response, which I will explain. This is a nice diagram comparing the varying sizes of particulates in the air. The smallest object humans can see is about 50 microns, the head of a pin. When we studied the health effects of particular matter, we started 10 microns, slightly smaller than pollen. The size most frequently studied is 2.5 microns or lower, which is the size of smaller cells like bacteria. Particulates can also be smaller than 0.1 microns, the size of a virus or even smaller, which we call ultrafine particulate matter or nanoparticles. This image of particular matter, according to size, helps to explain a couple of points. Volatile and especially semi-volatile organic compounds can easily become attached or adsorbed to the surface of particulates. Please don't ask me to explain physics, but it's a basic rule of physics that because smaller particulates have less mass, they will have a relatively greater amount of surface area. 
The ultrafine particulate seen on your right have the largest relative surface area and thus carry the highest amount of adsorbed, potentially toxic material, such as the VOCs and SVOCs, or heavy metals found in the air like cadmium or chromium, or iron found elevated in subways. The first particulate matter gets filtered in the upper airways and doesn't infiltrate deep into the lungs. Maybe they'll cause some local contact irritation in the upper respiratory system. As a result, cells of the immune system respond to trap and remove them. This is inflammation, the body's response to an irritant. The 2.5 micron fine particulate matter can penetrate further down towards the deepest part of the lung and even the alveoli, and some can enter the bloodstream. But the ultrafine particulate matter, which is the most plentiful, easily gets through the barriers of protection to enter the bloodstream and enhance the translocation of the adsorbed chemicals into the body as well. Sometimes these very tiny particles can even enter the nerve cells in the respiratory tract and get transferred directly into the brain. Particulates can have different compositions because they come from a variety of sources, such as burning fossil fuels, industry, wood fires, cook, cooking, and even plastics. Ninety-five percent of plastic is derived from fossil fuel petrochemicals, crude oil, and natural gas. Contamination is a global problem, not just because of garbage, but due to their formation of microplastics and nanoplastics in the air. They easily enter cells and induce oxidative stress and inflammation. Thus far, there's limited evidence of safe air harm, but they can impact metabolic disorders like diabetes. Several reports suggest that they are involved in induction of the developmental toxicity and neurotoxicity. Of importance is that the levels are higher indoors. That they're used in food packaging is obvious, but they're also used in cosmetics and personal care products like facial masks, lipstick, mascara, eyeshadow, anti-wrinkle cream, soap, shampoo, conditioners, moisturizers, shower gel, hairspray, hair coloring, scrubs, toothpaste, deodorant, shaving creams, sunscreens, and insect repellent. They're also found in textiles like yoga pants, t-shirts, jeans, fleece, socks, running shorts, acrylic onesies, and microfiber cleaning cloths. This slide emphasizes the relatively higher indoor microplastic exposures in young children, just according to the weight. So here's a question. Are low dose exposures toxic? Traditional toxicology has evolved. In classical toxicology, it's the dose that makes the poison. Virtually any substance, even water and oxygen, can be toxic if taken in a large enough quantity, and substances generally considered toxic can be harmless or even beneficial in small amounts, such as medications. We understand that a toxic substance directly causes cellular damage and induces malfunction by targeting proteins, including enzymes, as well as lipid membranes, DNA, and other components of the cell. Low doses of chemicals can have effects that differ from their effects at high doses. A phenomenon called signal toxicology occurs when a chemical binds to specific receptors. There is resulting abnormal signaling induces adverse changes in cell function. For example, some chemicals disrupt hormone signaling and are classified as hormone disruptors, such as the stain repellents and flame retardants found in the indoor environment. Even very low doses can be detected and can stimulate the production of more receptors called receptor upregulation, resulting in increased detection and stronger responses. In 2021, the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine was awarded to David Julius and Arden Patapusin for the discovery of a family of receptors called transient receptor potential, or TRP. These receptors provide the molecular basis for our understanding of how nerves convert sensory stimuli into signals that can be sensed by the brain. They play a fundamental role in cell signaling. They transmit signals into cells in response to multiple chemical and physical stimuli. 
and these chemosensitive receptors can become sensitized. These tier receptors are described as polymodal, meaning they perform a variety of functions. They're cellular sensors for a wide spectrum of physical and chemical stimuli, not just one. And they're exquisitely sensitive. They enable cells to read and respond to a variety of environmental changes. They're widely distributed in many tissues and cell types, especially in the nervous system. And they're involved in the senses, smell, taste, sight, hearing, temperature, touch, and pain. Two of these TRP receptors are known as TRPV1 and TRPA1. They are highly expressed in the sensory nerves in the respiratory tract, meaning there are many of them. Each can sense a multitude of different chemicals. They're also activated by oxidative stress and systemic inflammatory mediators, which are the chemical messengers involved in the process of inflammation. These receptors can be sensitized by repeated exposures to stimulants, such as chemicals, oxidative stress, or systemic inflammation. These same receptors are involved in chronic cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurodegenerative diseases. Many people report sensitivity to common chemicals. Up to 60% of asthmatics and 70% of migraine patients report exacerbations from chemical odors, such as those emitted by perfume, cleaning products, paint, and gasoline. Multiple studies conducted in Canada, the US, Germany, Sweden, Finland, Australia, Korea, and Japan find that the prevalence of self-reported sensitivity occurs from nine to 16% of the population and 0.5 to 3.9% of those surveyed self-report having been medically diagnosed with multiple chemical sensitivity, or MCS. Question, does MCS really exist? Can people really become sensitized to common chemicals? And these are 21 published peer-reviewed studies which consistently demonstrate that the two chemosensitive receptors, TRPV1, and TRPA1 are sensitized in MCS. 21, functional brain imaging. Multiple case con control studies have been published using functional brain imaging studies, which looked for changes in the brain when MCS patients were challenged with odors. What was observed was increased activity in various locations of the brain responsible for motivational, emotional, and non-conscious processing of information. Results varied, but two systematic reviews of these studies suggested that chemical odors are processed differently by MCS patients. What's important to note is that the majority of the challenge substances used were TRPV1 or TRPA1 stimulants, and the measured changes occurred in brain areas where these receptors are expressed. Multiple definitions of MCS have been published, but the one common characteristic is that symptoms are linked to exposures to low levels of chemicals that are common, ubiquitous, seemingly everywhere. They're tolerated before the onset of the condition and are tolerated by most other people. Multiple systems are involved, including the nervous, respiratory, gastrointestinal, and cardiovascular systems. The symptoms are not specific and vary widely. Most common are central nervous system complaints, such as poor cognition, fatigue, pain, and headache. And the second most common symptoms are respiratory and include a sensation of air hunger, pressure over the chest, coughing, phlegm, hoarseness, and nasal congestion. So what's it like to have MCS? Most reactions are to VOCs common in the indoor air, especially scented products. Common reactions include migraines, cognitive impairment, breathing difficulties, nausea, heart palpitations, and skin problems. Unfortunately, there's no known treatment. Management of this condition means avoidance of known triggers, which can be associated with a reduced quality of life. Having symptoms triggered by ubiquitous chemical exposures interferes with the ability to carry out even the most fundamental activities of daily living because people with MCS can't safely attend work 
for access health care because of chemical exposures in hospitals, medical clinics, ambulances, or laboratories. People with MCS often can't use public transportation, public buildings. Can't be access either, like schools and universities, gyms to work out in, libraries, shopping malls, theaters, or houses of worship because of scents emitted from the products worn by others. Sometimes they can't even find safe housing. The experience of those with MCS is that other people often lack belief and understanding, including friends, family, co-workers, employers, healthcare professionals. They're confronted by people's unwillingness to limit their chemical use. This results in stigmatization, loss of meaningful and productive activities, social isolation, financial loss, frustration and anger and anxiety and depression. MCS is recognized as a medical disability by the Canadian Human Rights Commission, but most other disabilities are generally understood by the common by the community with accessibility, support from law and standards. People are likely to offer support to someone who's using a white cane to negotiate crossing a busy street. But MCS is a hidden disability and there are no laws or standards to enhance accessibility. Therefore, those with MCS depend on others to make informed product choices to allow for their inclusion and accessibility to employment, healthcare, public transportation, and so on. But the reality is that when what predominates are knowledge gaps, barriers, and negative attitudes in the healthcare system and society in general. A scent-free policy is the best accommodation and reducing indoor chemical exposure sources is good for everyone. When I first encountered patients complaining of sensitivity to chemical scents, some described themselves as the proverbial canaries in the coal mine, warning that scents that didn't bother others, including me, were toxic. I never said anything, but it made no sense to me because the concepts of environmental health had not even involved, evolved yet, but they are canaries and we should heed their warnings. Remember this slide when you took that slow, deep breath and felt nothing except for the expansion and contraction of your chest? Maybe you detected an odor, but unless you have chemical sensitivity, you felt none of the reactions by your defense mechanisms responding to toxic pollutants. The sensory systems of the canaries are more sensitive than yours. We need to listen to the canaries. Air pollution is a risk factor for climate change developing and exacerbating non-communicable chronic diseases. And chemical sensitivity. We should all be checking the air quality health index every day. It tells us when we should reduce our activities to not exercise, to avoid demon inhalations or to stay indoors. We also need to stay indoors during heat waves unless we have no air conditioning. Can we depend on the fossil fuel industry to effectively modify air pollution? Can we depend on our politicians to effectively modify air pollution? As David Suzuki once said, we're in a giant car heading towards a brick wall and everyone's arguing over where they're going to sit. But the air pollution in your house is a modifiable risk factor. What can you do to modify it? Eliminate the use of products and emitting scents and other VOCs. Stop polluting your own breathing space and eliminate your children's exposures. Stop contaminating the air we share with others. Stop contributing to outdoor air pollution, the production of ozone and global warming. Eliminate the use of plastics. You can decrease your exposures and planet contamination. You can advocate for scent-free policies at work and schools. And you can call your MP and demand transparent labeling. A recently published paper found that VLCs in homes from scented products have been steadily increasing. You can drive the market to change. This graph, taken from the same recently published paper, shows a reduction of almost 50% in the amount of VLCs in the indoor air from paint over the last 25 years. Many consumers now know about low VLC paint. Once the market was better informed and people started asking for low VOC paints, 
the industry responded accordingly and even reduced the price. What else can you do? If you own your own home, you can make it more airtight, increase the ventilation and filter the incoming and recycled air. You can install a heat recovery ventilation system. You can use portable air filters in the living areas and when required, search for safer building materials and furnishings. Can you depend on your doctor to advise you on environmental health uses and advocate on your behalf? While environmental health education is lacking in continuing medical, undergraduate and postgraduate education. The environmental chemical exposure assessment is largely overlooked by clinicians and their environmental health knowledge is rated as low. Students and residents lack training in environmental health and the most common resource access is the internet. This may be because residents rate their mentors knowledge in environmental health as low. Canada needs a center of excellence for environmental health and the sooner the better. The widespread and ubiquitous exposure to persistent bioaccumulative and carcinogenic and endocrine disrupting chemicals continues, and it's not going to stop. The global chemical industry was valued at more than $5 trillion in 2017, and that is projected to double by 2030. Canada does not have sustained, sustained support nor a dedicated home for environmental health research funding. Environmental health training for healthcare pro professionals is lacking. MCS is an orphan condition. Minimal government funding is provided for the clinical practice of environmental medicine in only two clinics in the country, one in Nova Scotia and one in Ontario. We need to decide what environmental health care, public health research, education, and policy decision makers. The urgency of cutting edge environmental health education and research cannot be more clear. In 2009, the countries that make up the G20 publicly promised to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies over the medium term. These subsidies are government financial support or incentives provided to the fossil fuel industry that are considered economically wasteful, environmentally harmful, or socially unjust. 14 years later, in July 2023, Canada published its plan for eliminating inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, stating they are the first country among wealthy, heavy emitting emissions to do so. Perhaps this money could be used to fund the Center of Excellence on Research to try to mitigate the damage done. There are a few more reasons to care about what we've done to the environment. Consequences from global warming and air pollution exposure are distributed inequitably. Low-income communities and certain racial and ethnic groups often experience the greatest harm. Furthermore, people with disabilities are more likely to be impacted. A significantly higher percentage of people with disabilities live closer to pollution sources. A significantly higher percentage of children with disabilities reside in school districts with greater air pollution exposures. With respect to climate change, the global mortality rate in natural disasters is four times higher for people with disabilities. And during heat waves, they are at an increased risk for heat exhaustion and heat stroke compared to others. We need to do something about this too. Now we all need to take a breath of fresh air. I thank you for listening and apologize for the inconvenience of how I manage these slides. Thank you, Dr. Malat. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> we could probably have time for a couple of questions if anybody has anything. So I've heard that in order to uh, effectively filter VOCs from the indoor air environment that you need a lot more um, like granular activated carbon or, or activated carbon than most commercial air purifiers actually have. I don't know if this was an exaggeration, but I heard you needed like a huge amount. Um, whereas like the one I have, the air purifiers is a really thin, uh, thin layer. So 
is that true? <laughs> like what amount of, of granular or of activated carbon is effective for this? Um, well, for particulates, you can get MERVs um, uh, higher than our traditionally provided in homes, which I think is maybe 13. You can get higher ones. It's just you need to spend a lot more money. I, I know that uh, there are very high ones used in um, in ho hospital uh, surgical rooms, for example. Um, but if you want to remove VOCs, the HEPA filters don't work. Um, they only remove particulates particles down to 0.3 microns, so they're not going to get lower than that, which is the size of uh, the molecules in a gas phase. If you want to remove VOCs in your home or anywhere else, you need to add something which pulls out the VOCs, attracts them, such as activated charcoal or carbon. Um, you don't want to obviously uh, filter out the gases because that's like putting a plastic bag tightly over your head. You filter out the oxygen and carbon dioxide too. Um, but you, there are filter systems um, that are being developed to remove VOCs as well. Okay, um, probably have time for one more question. Is there anyone else in the room or on Zoom, Dusty? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is Jeff. Um, I deal with uh, regulatory issues in the oil and gas, and we focus on air quality, our team. So I'm wondering, in your view, if uh, you see them equal or one more important than the other when we look at toxics versus uh, air pollution in, in the traditional sense, like ozone and particulate matter? Well, certainly with respect to what's happening in the planet um, and, you know, the, the risk for the survival of civilization and on all the things that are probably going to happen because global warming has already started. Um, whatever can be done to to diminish the air pollution outside is is absolutely mandatory. But I'm a doctor and 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 I see patients one at a time. Um, your your job obviously is to be more of a of a doctor for the environment, whereas I'm a doctor for individuals. And what we're seeing is, is, um, is people getting more and more chronic diseases, not just because the population is getting older, but the influence of um, um, the uh, pollution from the outdoors. What I try to emphasize is that all the studies, and there's so many of them, that show that chronic exposures to outdoor air pollution causes or sorry impacts then uh, chronic disease and influences the development um, in, impacts with uh, causing exacerbations all those studies are confounded by the fact that people are actually indoors so depending on the building that you're in it may be airtight it may be really leaky and old uh, how much exposure you actually have in it having it's confounded also by the contamination that we produce indoors especially by the, the habits and, and the products that we use um, to, to clean, to apply to our skin. Um, it, it, coming from my perspective, I do not understand why the world has to smell like a bowl of fruit. Dr. Malat, um, I have to say, I really appreciated our conversation when I was uh, speaking to all the speakers to try to set things up. Everybody was so um, enthusiastic and wanted to be. That was the easiest part of this conference. That so was like in two days, I had everybody set up. And Dr. Malat was really great. So we're really glad for you to set the tone about the air quality, indoor and outdoor. As we go through the day, we're going to kind of be coming back to that a lot. And we will be sending you a little thank you gift. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope that you stay on and enjoy the rest of the workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you. So next, um, we are going to be listening to Darren Tarr, who is the Supervisor of Industrial Hygiene Air Quality Laboratory at New Brunswick's Research and Productivity Council in Fredericton. He attended the Nova Scotia Agricultural College, Dalhousie University in Truro, Nova Scotia, obtaining his degree in environmental science and agriculture. He is a certified radon measurement technician through the Canadian National Radon Proficiency Program and a member of the Canadian Association of Radon Scientists and Technologists. He joined RPC's Industrial Hygiene Lab in 2009 and has been helping people 
with their air quality and radon concerns and questions since then. And our team has been working very closely with RPC about radon and stuff. So definitely speak with Melanie and different people from our team today and listen, enjoy your listening to uh, Darren. So he's going to now, I'm gonna introduce you Darren to our RPC science and engineering. His topic is radon, uh, the impact testing and mitigation. And he's gonna cram all that into 20 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoying the, the program so far. And uh, thanks to Dr. Malat for that wonderful presentation. So, so I guess we'll start with, well, some of the topics that we're kind of cover is uh, what is radon gas? So a little bit over to that. Um, we'll also talk about why it's important to know what your levels are. Um, how can you fix it? So if you have an issue, what can you do to control the radon amount coming into your home? And then we'll cover a little bit on what we found in New Brunswick through RPC. So, so what is radon? So radon, it's a noble gas. So the issue with radon, um, it's colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless. So that's the, that's the problem. That's why people don't take it for granted. It's, uh, they don't smell it, they don't taste it. So they don't want to test for it. So it's, it's, it's a difficult topic to get across to people, but we're getting there for sure. Um, it's an inert gas, so it's chemically not bound or attached to anything, so that allows it to easily travel through the soil and get into the home. So outside, when it gets outside, it's fine. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll dilute with the outdoor air, um, but inside the home, it'll start to gather and increase in concentration, and that's when it becomes a problem, uh, especially now where all the homes are now starting to be airtight. They're trying to in increase the energy efficiency. Um, so this is an important topic for, for sure. Uh, oops, wrong button. <laughs> okay, so we'll go a little bit over. Um, so radon produces uh, radio, radioactive decay products, so RPDs, radio, radon daughters, uh, through ionizing radiation. So essentially you have protons and neutrons that are held together by a nuclear force, um, and the radioactivity is the result of the instability of some of those nuclei where there may be too few or too many to satisfy the energy requirements of the nucleus. So this leads to radioactive decay, okay, which is the disintegration of the nuclei of atoms in a radioactive element. Um, these disintegrations essentially are accompanied by energy bursts or releases of energy. So as the nucleus of the atom releases the particles and energy, um, it changes the nucleus of the atom into a different, or a nucleus into a different atom. So all radioactive elements have a decay chain, the decay chain, sorry about that. So, oops, go back. Okay, so what does this mean? So radon has a half-life of 3.8 days. So essentially every 3.8 days, you reduce your radon by half as much. So if you have 200, 3.8 days, you have 100, 3.8 days, so it continues like that. So they're very important because it will determine how much radon is actually being dispersed into the environment. So with radon gas being an inert, or radon being an inert gas, it's easily gonna travel in, so it's easily gonna access your home or in, in through, the, through your foundation or, or, or otherwise. Okay. So the other issue is the radon decay chain has, um, Short, so the uh, plenolium to, oops, did it again. <laughs> there it is. Plenolium 218, lead 214, plenolium 214. So these have a lot shorter half lives. Okay, so the plenolium 218 has a three minute half life. Uh, plenolium 214 has a microsecond, 164 microsecond half life. Lead 214 has a 27 seven minute half life. So that's important because. Um, as they enter your lungs, there's going to be a lot more radioactive decay happening. So as you're breathing them in, okay. So the other issue is with the radon de decay products, these is that their properties allow them to easily attach themselves to, to smaller particles. So dust in your home, that sort of thing. So in some of the smaller particulate matter, like 2.5, um, that can reach down deep, deep into your lungs. And that's what causes the issue, um, depending on. Sorry. 
So in, in, a, in a home, like say they can plate out. So if they attach themselves to the wall or something like that, they're gonna call it, it's called plating out. Um, but like say, if you breathe them in, it gets deep and down in your lungs, and that can cause the issue. So basically uranium has a half-life of about 4.5 billion years. The earth is about 5 billion years old estimated. So this is gonna be a problem for, for many, many years to come. Okay. So Health Canada did, they did a study uh, quite a while ago, um, back in 2009 to 2012, a uh, cross-country study um, where they measured, they sent out radon kits to many, many of the communities. Um, and basically they found that radon was everywhere. There's every single place, there's no radon free zone. Um, some of the higher areas, well, one of the highest. So New Brunswick was at 20.6% of homes had radon levels above 200 becquerels. Um, Manitoba came in at second at 19.4%, uh, Nova Scotia at 10.7 PEI at 3.5% uh, of the homes had levels above 200. Um, Canada as a whole, the average out at about 3.5%. Uh, so, so the main thing is that there's, there's radon everywhere. Okay, so how does it enter your home? Okay, so Typically, it's going to go through your, into your home through cracks in the foundation. Um, any pipe chases that aren't sealed, that sort of thing. Um, sump pumps, sump pits, if they're not sealed well. Um, it's pressure related. So the negative pressure, so your home's basically set it up. It's a negative pressure. So it's constantly drawing gases in. Um, temperature, affected by temperature as well. If it's cold outside, your house is closed up more. Um, you get the heat going, so you're gonna, it's going to draw more right on in through those as well. Um, wind can be a factor as well. If uh, you have a strong wind coming up against the, the side of a, of a mountain, say it's on a higher elevation, it can actually force where the, the soil is porous, it'll actually force that radon and, and, and get it moving through the soil pores a lot easier as well. And then you also have mechanical. So, um, if you have a bathroom fan running, or if you have uh, a dryer, so that makeup air, so you're going to get that makeup air has to come from somewhere. So if your house is closed up real tight, uh, it's probably going to come in through cracks in the foundation or those, those sorts of areas. So um, you can get it through groundwater. So uh, basically, it's going to come through your pipes, and as it's aerated and comes out of the taps and that sort of thing, it's uh, the dissolved gases release, and that could increase your, your uh, radon levels as well. Um, so it will also move your home through diffusion. So from higher to lower concentrations, it'll, it'll naturally move through. And then you can also have radon. It's not really studied very much, but uh, through countertops. So sometimes you have granite countertops, you could have some radon coming from that, but I don't think it's, it's very common. Okay. So what, what influences radon? Okay. So if you have a high source, there's a lot of radon, you need a source. So if you have higher source area, you're gonna have probably more instances of, of higher radon in those homes. Um, soil type. So if you have a, sand, a sandier soil, uh, the radon gas can move through easier um, versus like a clay surface or something like that where it's not gonna, it's gonna block, it's gonna stop it from coming through as easily. The home construction, so depending on how much foundation is, is, is contacting the home, if you have larger foundations, more spread out versus a higher home, um, you could have higher concentration of radon. It gives a little more area for, for cracks and, and, and stuff, uh, as well as occupant lifestyle. So if you're opening up your windows and your doors more, then you're going to have less radon, essentially. Um, then versus if you had it more closed up and you, you run your air condition a little more. Uh, as well as, like I said, as we mentioned before, the wind temperature, barometric pressure, and the precipitation. So um, it's usually typically higher in the, uh, in the winter time. And when your house is closed up more, you're spending more time in, you're more susceptible, you're more exposed to the radon gas in your home if it's in your homes. So radon in health, so why is this important? Um, so Health Canada estimates non-smoker exposed to high radon levels over their lifetime has a 1 in 20 chance of developing lung cancer. Okay. Now, if you're a smoker, that would increase to 1, so it's estimation that increases to 1 in 3 chance of developing lung cancer for that over your lifetime. 
So this was, is from the EPA. A um, uh, thousand people were exposed to radon levels. I, I kind of I like this uh, little graphic there. It kind of breaks it down. It shows a little better. Um, a thousand people were exposed to radon at this level over a lifetime. But 740 becquerels, if you were a smoker, it's estimated that 260 smokers could develop lung cancer versus non-smokers at 36. Um, when you go down 370, 150, 18, 296, 120 versus 15 at 148 becquerels. Um, so it's substantial if you smoke versus non-smokers and, and getting possibly getting lung cancer. So it's very important. Okay, radon testing methods. So there, there's several different uh, testing methods. Um, radon in the, uh, electric detectors. So electric detectors essentially uh, there's a disc, and inside the disc, there's a, it's basically a voltage applied to it. So as the radon enters and it starts to decay, uh, you're going to get a drop in voltage. So we do a before and after, basically, reading to determine the radon levels. Uh, alpha track detectors. So inside the detector, there's a little plastic uh, disc. And as the radon decays, it'll actually make little, little notches in that disc just from all the energy bursts. Um, and then you can utilize the number of tracks that have been created by the radon gas decays um, in the time that it's been exposed and determine the concentration between. Um, so we can determine how much radon is there. Charcoal canisters, they're not used as often. Um, they're, uh, they, they can utilize those for short-term um, testing as well, I guess uh, screening essentially. Um, and what's coming out a little bit more popular are the continuous radon monitors. So they'll, they'll monitor your, your radon levels over a time and they can actually graph it. Um, there's professional monitors that are, uh, that are a little more expensive. They have to be calibrated yearly. Uh, they're utilized by a lot of uh, remediation folks and, uh, and um, homeowner alternatives. So you can buy a, a cheaper radon monitor. Um, the CNRPP did a study there a little while ago um, basically determining which ones are better, and you can find that on the CNRPP website. Um, but they, they work as well, very well. I know the, uh, the uh, remediation, when most of the remediation companies, when they install a system, they'll actually give one of these monitors so they can, the homeowners can kind of monitor it as they go. Some of them will actually send them, send the, uh, the, the amounts to their phone if they, they want, and, uh, and it'll alert them if it, it does spike a little bit, so. So you have short and long-term testing options. Um, now, long-term testing is the way to go. Um, you can do short-term tests, but they recommend you always follow up a short-term test with a long-term test. Um, radon is constantly fluctuating, obviously. It's, uh, so we don't wanna take that data, I guess, or essentially what you, uh, what you see from a short-term test and say, oh, well, my radon levels are gonna be high. They always recommend to follow it up with a, with a longer term test. So a long term test is a 90 day plus test. You can run them up to 365 days. Um, short term test is, is typically two to seven days. Um, mostly four days is, is where they what they recommend. So okay, Health Canada. So what do you do if your if your levels are high? So Health Canada has recommendations on when to when to remediate. Um, so there's technically no safe level of radon, um, but Health Canada had decided uh, 200 becquerels, so you'd be below 200 becquerels. Um, if you're there, then you're okay. Um, there's other jurisdictions, I guess the states, they recommend 148 becquerels as the maximum limit, um, and the World Health Organization recommends be below 100. So a lot of people will look at that 100 and say, oh, I wanna get my levels down to that, that, that level area. <laughs> um, so if you're between 200 and 600, 201 becquerels to 200 or 600 becquerels, they recommend it to remediate within two years. So you could actually do well, I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, you can actually maybe try to fix it without installing one of these systems, which I'll cover in a minute and 600. So if you're over 600 becquerels per meter cubed, then they recommend uh, remediating within a year. So radon removal. So what can you do if you do have a very high radon? So this 
is a sub-slab depressurization system. So um, typically what they will do is they'll, uh, they'll drill a hole in your foundation, okay? And they'll dig out a little bit of the, uh, the soil underneath and then replace it with uh, a, a more coarse aggregate. Um, and the line would go up and there's actually a fan. Now this is a more of a, a system that you'd use in a warmer climate, but the fan right here, it's an active system. So it's constantly drawing and changing. It's adding a negative pressure essentially. And it's drawing the radon gas out before it can enter your home. Okay. Um, there's also other, other options. You can do ventilation methods, increasing your ventilation. Um, there's, there's ways to fix it in the crawl space if you have a dirt floor. Or you can also close entry routes, uh, some pumps, cracks, pipe chases, that sort of thing, to prevent it from coming into the home. All right, um, sump pump depressurization. So if your your home has a sump pump, they can actually utilize that hole to uh, install a system to remove it. So that's that's one way they can do it. Um, they have I don't know how often it's utilized, but they can utilize the drainage system and depressurize underneath by using your, your drain tile or, or uh, any, any drains that you have in your home. I've heard of some, some remediation folks doing that as, as well, and it seems to, according to him, it seems to work fairly well. Um, there's also, if you have an exposed dirt floor, now unfortunately it's a little more expensive, but they can put a membrane down um, and utilize that, seal it along the side of the wall of your foundation to remove the, the radon as well. It's a little more expensive. and. Some, from some of the horror stories, they get in some pretty tight spots where they're crawling on their stomachs trying to install this, so it gets a little more expensive. So the gold standard is the sub-slab depressurization system. Um, it ranges from talking with the remediation folks um, between $2,100 to about $3,500. Um, and it's really going to depend on how many wells they have to. Um, they might have to put multiple suction points as well in, in the home, so that it will increase the cost a little bit. Um, and to make sure that it's reaching all corners of the foundation, Canada actually implemented in their standard that they have to do uh, communications. So they have to find out, they'll drill several holes in the corner of the foundation and see how much draw or how much suction is, is, is being, being uh, was happening, I guess, just to make sure everything's in, in good working condition. Great on removal. So sealing entry routes. We had a, had a gentleman actually at RPC. His, his, uh, his levels were, were a little bit high. Um, so we got chatting about it and he had an open sump pump. So his, high, his levels were around 600. And when he sealed up his sump pump area, it brought the levels down to below 200 at the time. Since then, he has installed a remediation system and, and, it's, and I think he's down to like 40 some now. So they, they do work very well. Um, floor drains. We had another individual who had a floor drain in their basement area. Um, and you can get drain, like special raid on drain systems that will allow the water out, but will not let the gases back up. So I think in that instance, the lady was around 500 becquerels. And then when she installed these floor drains in her home, it dropped it down below, below 100, I believe, as well as, as a ceiling, like cracks in your foundation, wall joints and, and control joints as well. Uh, that's a little more difficult because a lot of homes now are, are, they've got finished basements and you don't want to rip up your your floors to try to fix the situation. So um, the sub-slab depressurization is usually the, the go-to. Um, and then me mechanical ventilation. So the HRV, heat recovery ventilator, um, they work great, but the main thing is you have to have them clean. You gotta clean them. Um, right on repair, that gentleman, Jeff, he mentioned in his last talk that to clean your, your HRV four times a year. So I am well behind that. <laughs> I definitely need to do a little more maintenance on that. So. So that's some, some rain on removal options. And it'll depend on what your levels are, of course. If you're just above 100 or best above 200, or you want to be below 200, then, I mean, you can, like, say, fix the cracks in the foundation or whatnot and do another test. But that's a little bit more lengthy. It takes a little more time. So, so RPC, what have we found? So this is actually a, uh, a alpha track, plastic, uh, and that's the little indents from the energy. So as, as I mentioned before, as the radon enters and as it's disintegrating, it's making those little marks. And some of these are the little marks that are made um, from that. And then that's the plastic right there as well. 
So this is our preliminary map. Um, this is a public, our public map. We do have an internal map as well, which has a little bit more um, data on it. Um, so we, had, we do have, still have a lot of areas that are, are not measured. So um, everything we've done, so the darker is uh, 41 to 50% of the homes are exceeding the 200 limit. So up north, um, and then in some of the areas around here, we, we found some higher rate on levels. And then as the, the colors drop down, uh, it gets a little less and less to like Fredericton area. So we, we do have some more areas that we do have to, uh, to get to, with, that's our plan um, in the future, is to try to get some of these locations, get more radon tests out there um, to measure some of these upper areas here. So, and like I say, this is, uh, we do have a lot more data, but we need just to make sure that we're allowed to put that out there to the public. We have to have permission by the, uh, the folks uh, that allow that do the testing um, and if they don't allow us or don't want us to then we, we can't put it in the map but a lot of people have uh, they believe that if they give us the information um, to utilize in something like this that it's going to decrease the value of the home because they're going to be known as a hot spot area for radon so a lot of people are a little reluctant to to do that um, but the main thing is it's it's dependent on your foundation. We've done attached like townhouses, row houses, where one house might be good, the next house attached with just a firewall might be good, but the middle one might be might be high. So, and that's because when I think when the gentleman went in and uh, the owner of the building who was renting it out went in and looked and there was a big crack in the foundation. So it really depends on your foundation. And of course you need a source, but it's... Uh... So, what else have we been doing? So radon awareness, so that's, that's key. So as of right now, um, we are uh, working. So we're teaming up with, with other associations. So MB Lung, we've been working closely with MB Lung um, to try to get the word out there. Um, we give them premium pricing on, on test kits that allows them to get more kits, more homes tested as well. Um, we couldn't do that in the past. We were doing... Uh, Electrat, radon electrats. Now, the electrats are a little more expensive. Um, they're a little more difficult to ship and whatnot. So when we were approached by MB Lung to maybe get something going with Alpha Tracks, uh, we looked into it and, and we just, we, we've technology up and running. So that allows us to reach a lot more homes, a lot more people. Um, community events, um, we've actually been working a little bit with uh, MB Lung. They've been uh, spearheading this. We've had a couple of community events where We've gone to communities. Uh, we've talked to the uh, the residents. Um, there's typically there's a presentation where um, they, they can uh, learn more about radon and they can uh, ask any questions. And Health Canada, uh, Lemby Lung, RPC, we did one in Havelock. We all donated some kits to help with the uh, the occasion. And uh, it's 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 a really good event, and and it gets people a lot of people thinking and uh, getting uh, learning more about radon. We had just uh, we, did one back in I think it was last week actually in St Andrews where Health Canada donated uh, I think it was almost close to 500 435 kits and MV Lung also donated donated some kits and that was a, a really huge event. Um, there's also some library lending programs I know MV Lung and I'm sorry, I don't know if Nova Scotia Lung as well are uh, implementing um, library lending so you can go to a library you can reserve a short-term radon a continuous radon monitor and uh, utilize that for a month just to see where your radon levels are. Um, as well as, as social media, um, we're working with Dusty. We're trying to get the word out there and our team with Scott and, uh, and Amy and uh, just trying to get more social media, more outreach. And as far as with, with RPC, you know, I can't speak on the other labs across the country, but I think our business is, is more than tripled. We've had more than tripled the amount of, of radon tests last year. So it definitely, definitely is, is working quite well. Um, so, and yes, so the main thing is like, is, has everybody tested their home? Anybody? Yeah, everyone? No? Okay. Right <laughs> You're just running right now. So if you do want a kit, um, you can actually purchase them if you go through the MV Lung website. Um, you can purchase them. They come with uh, return postage, and I think it's $60 for the kit. And like I say, everything's analyzed at RPC if you go through MV Lung and stays in, in, in Canada. So, perfect. Is there any questions or anything? 
Da. 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 Mm -hmm. You can, okay, yes, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, nope, it's, uh, it's a great program. Like I say, just to get the awareness out there. Um, like early on, we've been doing radon since 2007 when we started with the Alvatra or the uh, radon electrats, and we go to home shows. And we have a radon draw, and we get so many people coming, and we give them five, oh, sorry, I think five radon kits. So five free radon kits, and we had so many people filling out the form for one. And when the time came and we called those folks up, they didn't want to know. Right? Oh, I don't care. I don't want to know. I think they were coming for our swag or nice, nice pens and stuff. So, but yeah, and I think MB Lung has uh, 40 units, I believe, that they've got. And uh, they're getting it out to, uh, to not, not just the libraries, but they're also the, the counselors and the representatives of the government. Um, next couple of weeks, perfect, yeah. Okay, perfect. And then uh, health can't, oh, sorry, Mel, pardon? Okay, no. <laughs> also Health Canada, they did a big uh, postcard drive this year where they've sent out, oh, I'm not sure, where thousands of different postcards just with radon information and just randomly sent them out to different municipalities. Um, so it's, like I say, we're, we're getting there. The, 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 the word's getting out there. The information's getting out there. More people are testing and, uh, it's 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 a good thing for sure. Yeah. Yes. I would so, so right now like there's uh in the building code they have to basically lay out uh, re this remediation techniques I guess so they're gonna put more barriers in they're gonna rough in the pipe. So if there is radon, then they can just easily attach the fan, create an active pressurization system and remove it. So I would say, um, if it's, if, as long as it doesn't crack um, and there's no direct entry routes, then it, it, yes, no, I would say it'll help. You're required to rough it in. So yeah, so what they'll do is they'll put the pipe in and they'll cap it off. Um, and once it caps off, and then uh, if you do have an issue, then you can just attach the fan and, and push it through. Sorry, Sarah. Yeah. Hi, great presentation. Um, I'm just curious. I I'm I'm just finishing up a two-year testing program in First Nations. Yeah. Uh, you had a nice map there. Is there a place that we can, is there a central radon data point that we can send off? I've got nice Excel sheets with some nice data that they're quite willing to share, but is there a place that this should all be going to to kind of centralize the radon results and data? I was like, talking with Health Canada, we were talking the other, well, at the, the uh, St. Andrews event, and they're trying to get some more information together for sure. Um, our goal, it'd be nice if we can get some more um nova scotia tests and stuff and start building a map as well with that so um we can definitely talk about it a little after the fact and uh Are you sure go the yes okay. yeah i was just going to send it to you and let you do whatever you wanted with it but <laughs> <laughs> I I am not aware. Rashidi might might know. Yes, uh, <laughs> I can definitely look into it. And uh... hi, thanks. Um, I'm I'm Rashini. I'm the former radon specialist for Atlantic, <laughs> but I I still kind of know a little bit uh, for data stuff. Uh, as you were saying. Um, data sharing and having like a public map and stuff. I believe that the Technical Operations Lab at Health Canada, uh, based in on in Ottawa, uh, they have been building and updating these maps. Uh, so I can connect you, I can give you their like email address or whatever, and you can kind of, and with you too. <laughs> so, so yeah, like that was one of the ideas um, 
over the last few years was having this centralized uh, area where we could have like maps and a database and stuff like that. So I can give you the contact information for that. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, Darren, so much. I know there's lots of yeah, questions. Yeah, no worries. I'll be here all day. Here all day. Yes. And Talk to you about radon, and Melanie's also really great at it. So here's a little thank you, Darren. You get some uh, lung buddy and some lung socks, oh, and be lung socks. So thank, thank you, you so very much, much Darren. <laughs> you. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Carlin Matz, who received her PhD in toxicology from the University of Saskatchewan in 2008, and she started with Health Canada shortly after. She's a senior science evaluator, evaluator in the AIR program and has worked on numerous risk assessments, including evaluations of diesel and gasoline exhausts and traffic related air pollution. She's also leading the evaluations of the health effects and health impacts of wildfire smoke. So we're really happy that um, Dr. Matz has flown in here today. Uh, she got approval last minute, <laughs> so we were happy. Uh, she's joined us and she's now going to speak to you on the health impacts of wildfire smoke in Canada and then we're going to start a whole wildfire morning so it's going to go bump 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 up until lunch so it's going to be quite interesting thank you welcome so, good morning everyone uh so thanks for the introduction Sarah I have I was going to introduce myself but I don't need to so uh, back at the office, uh, for, to support the return to office, I always tell a joke right on the little whiteboard. So I'll do the same for you guys this morning. Their dad jokes are terrible. Um, so last night I was out and I heard one on the waterfront and it was, how much does it cost a pirate to get his ears pierced? A buccaneer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Told you they're all terrible. They're all office appropriate. I got tons if you, if you want any more. Okay. so. So we'll get we'll get through it. So just as a little background, wildfire activity in Canada. Um, I know in this region you probably don't have a lot of experience until the last year. Uh, about eight thousand fires occur each year. It's two and a half million acres uh, burn on average. Last year was quite unprecedented with over eighteen point five million acres hectares hectares burned. Um, so most frequent activity is in British Columbia and then through the prairies and in the north. Uh, so as you can see here, this is our boreal forest zone which is where most of the fires occur. And then this is the corresponding, uh, these are the perimeters of the fires for the, about the last um, almost 30 years or close to 40 years, I should say. So as you can see, they, they quite overlap quite well between where the forests are and where the fires are. So as, we, as expected. So uh, the big issue when it comes to the wildfire smoke being from the air, from wildfires being from the air program, it's about the smoke. So wildfire smoke contains tons of pollutants uh, the big ones that we're worried about is PM 2.5, like was talked about this morning. We've got some carbon monoxide, some NOx, the VOCs that were also mentioned this morning, uh, pHs, and ozone can also be generated in the smoke plume. So one of the big issues with smoke is that uh, there's can have really intense exposures if you're in close proximity to the fire, but also the smoke will, trans, uh, will uh, travel with long range transport on the prevailing winds in impact areas quite uh, like up to thousands of kilometers away. And in Canada, wildfire smoke is one of the leading uh, contributors to population weighted PM 2.5 exposure. Transportation sources is about 20 some percent in this study and wildfire smoke was 17%. So they are quite, quite similar. There's a nice image. This is one of the fires hitting uh, British Columbia. And also there's a fire down here in uh, Washington state. And then you can see how the smoke is traveling. You know, my hometown of Regina being impacted. So, so while when it comes to public health risk, as I mentioned, it's a major source of exposure. So we have to be, you know, at Health Canada, we're interested in it. The epidemiological studies have identified numerous health effects. Uh, the strongest indications are for respiratory health effects. So this is like exacerbations of asthma, exacerbations of COPD, uh, premature mortality. There's growing evidence for uh, associations with cardiovascular health effects. So this is people going to the hospital because they're having um, a cardiovascular event and also some growing evidence for wildfires and wildfire smoke for reproductive health effects, especially uh, small birth weight. And there's also some growing evidence as well for the mental health effects. So this is people having experienced fires or wildfire smoke and the associated PTSD and anxiety type effects. And of course, some groups as always are always more impacted. There's always some disproportionately impacted groups. The main ones that have come out of the research so far is we've got the young children, uh, elderly women and people with pre-existing disease states. Also, populations with low socioeconomic status, 
indigenous populations and people living in remote areas, these are also these two groups are also associated with more likely to be in proximity to a fire zone. And also those engaged in strangers outdoor work, including wildland firefighters. I always love this image because none of them are wearing their PPE. So they've got much higher exposure. As you can see, like they're working right in the fires themselves. So uh, when Sarah reached out to me, the interest was in uh, this research that we did, uh, article that we published in 2020. Um, and so the purpose of this research, of this analysis, was to look at what are the health impacts of wildfire smoke. It was a retrospective analysis. And really by understanding what are the health impacts of like recent years, is it gives us an idea of what can we expect as climate change is anticipated to really increase uh, the wildfire frequency, severity, intensity. We're going to get more smoke, more frequent uh, wildfires, longer seasons. You know, basically what we've experienced in 2023 might become more of the norm. So understanding where we are now will give us a, a baseline for understanding where we could be in the future. And so to do this, we used a two-step approach, um, air quality modeling, and then our health impacts. And Melissa is here, so she'll probably talk a little bit more about this stuff. We didn't quite coordinate. Um, so I won't go really too far into the details on here, but really we use this uh, two different models. Uh, one is basically all the air quality health effect or um, everything that contributes to air quality in Canada, but not including wildfire smoke. And then one running the model again with wildfire emissions. So if you take them and you subtract them, you should be left just with the wildfire smoke um, exposure, right? You can see how you have one with everything, everything plus wildfire smoke, you take the difference and that's what we get. So that is where we say we've quantified the PM 2.5 between these two. So then, oh, okay, great. Uh, so this is what the results come from, from uh, Melissa's colleagues and our collaborators at ACCC. So this is for 2023. Uh, so we can see this was uh, a year, you guys might remember this year was the, uh, the Quebec had the fires in the north. And so you had, you know, you would have had more wildfire exposure uh, in this region. Uh, the typical, like we say, we can really see our boreal forest zones, and then also, you know, the uh, um, as a bit of a counterpoint to this morning one is that there is a lot of evidence of that the U.S. fires actually impact uh, Canada as well. Also, important to note the Y scale isn't um, linear, so all the blues are less than one microgram per meter cubed, and then the intense purple is 15. So just to bear in mind, it's a logarithmic scale as you look at it. Uh, 2014, quite a large fire there in the Northwest Territories. Uh, again, we have some activity in BC, and we can see, like what we see here is, we see how the long range transport, how the prevailing winds will push the smoke across the country. Uh, 2015, uh, so we had quite an intense fire right here near the border that year. This fire here in northern Saskatchewan actually started off as a prescribed burn up at the provincial park, and it got out of control and was in turn as uh, now known as the Rabbit Lake fire. But, and side note, prescribed burns that get out of control are then no longer considered prescribed burns. Uh, 2017, this was quite an intense year for uh, British Columbia. I probably remember a lot of the news coverage in Vancouver at the time with the really, really smoky skies and same with Calgary and Edmonton, really getting really intense clouds of smoke coming in for them. And 2018, uh, where the fires are a little bit more northerly uh, in Vancouver or in BC, and they were expecting a much like almost, almost like a similar year in 20, go ahead and go backwards for me. Okay, they were expecting almost a similar year and thankfully, you know, they were, they were spared. Um, but again, the key takeaway here is we see how the smoke goes across. And we also see year to year quite, although there's general trends with more in the, in the West and in BC and the boreal forest zone, but a fair bit of variability. You don't get, it's not the same year after year. So, um, also important factors with this is that we have this giant land mass in Canada, our population is not evenly distributed, right? Like, so we have our giant picture of Canada and then our population is really just along the US border for the most part. And so we looked at this as like, what is the land mass that's impacted by smoke? And then what is the population impacted by smoke? And so what you can see here is quite, quite a bit of difference between, between the two. What we see here, really interesting, is that except for 2023, which is this little box here, the entire population was exposed, or about 20 to 35% of the population, I should say, was exposed to at least one microgram per meter cubed of PM 2.5. The national average exposure is about seven to eight. So this is actually on a percentage wise, quite large. We see here, these two bars sort of stick out as you know quite high, but this is again, 2017. So that was when Vancouver, a large population center was experiencing, and Calgary and Edmonton as well those years, were experiencing quite high exposures. 
So now we understand the exposure, we use that to estimate the health impacts. So this health impact analysis is work that my group is very familiar with us quite frequently. We do it for regulations, for other initiatives. And for this, we use uh, the Air Quality Benefits Assessment Tool, or as we call it, ACBAT. And so ACBAT is a very powerful tool and is able to estimate the number of excess health outcomes um, based on a whole bunch of input data that goes in. And then also we're able to put an economic value on the health impacts, which is really important when you're doing sort of like cost benefit analyses for regulations. Um, and the, a lot of people, especially if I give these talks ever to Americans, they always just think it's healthcare costs, but it's not. There's a whole, um, whole part in there, including social welfare consequences, the medical costs, workplace productivity, and also increased mortality risk. So this is, that other slide is like the details of ACBAT, but I like this one better because it's a little bit more graphical. So we start with our source, the wildfire, and then our collaborators at ACCC are able to generate the air quality models. And then this is what feeds into ACBAT. So this side is ACBAT. So we're able to then take this exposure, apply it to the population. We've got all sorts of population data, and we're able to estimate the change in the pollution population exposure, or in this case, the population exposure attributable to our specific source. We have, we understand the baseline rates, we know the population counts, and we also know the concentration response function. That's really a very fancy way to say, we know how the uh, pollutant exposure impacts your increased risk of having an adverse health outcome. So that is what we do there, and that allows us to estimate the change in health effects or health impacts, and then we're able to put the dollar value on this. Okay. So also important part about ACBAT is that it calculates both the acute and the chronic health impacts. In wildfire smoke, acute is very easy to understand because as we talked about, wildfire season is variable year to year. So the acute health impacts really represents what is the exposure, what was the health impact of that year's exposure? What is your seasonal health impact? Very easy to understand. Chronic though is more like what would be if you had that type of wildfire season year over year over year, creating sustained exposures at that level. So it's a little it's easier to understand if you think about like a point source or like an industrial source that you don't have a large chronic change like over year of your exposure, but it is a bit of a, a mind think on the wildfire because you do have uh, quite, as we saw, quite, um, quite a bit of variability. So uh, to move into the results, people are always very interested in this. The biggest one always is the mortalities or premature deaths. So 2013, if you probably remember that it was the year of the Quebec fires. Exposures were a little bit lower across the country and it was associated with 54 premature deaths attributable to the wildfire smoke. Whereas 2017, where Vancouver was really impacted, we saw those higher population exposures, 240 um, premature deaths were associated with it across the country. And the economic value here was uh, $1.8 billion. ACBAT also calculates um, a whole suite of non-fatal cardiorespiratory outcomes like as acute respiratory symptom days, asthma days, respiratory emergency room visits or hospital admissions, same thing with cardiovascular. And so these have um, lower dollar values, but the numbers can be quite stag staggering. Like say, if you look at restricted activity days, like 3.2 million uh, respiratory days uh, impacted there. And so the dollar values here are as well. And then so the chronic, so back to the chronic, because back the idea if you had that type of year, year over year. So with that, uh, you end up with slightly higher numbers, so 2013 was our low end, was our lower bound, uh, associated with 570 premature deaths, and 2017 with 2,500 premature deaths. If you had that type of year, year over year, and the dollar values are accordingly. Um, so we got the lower end, 4 billion, and at the upper end, 19 billion. And we have one chronic um, non-fatal outcome, which is adult chronic bronchitis cases, and you can see those numbers as well. So we want to put this in perspective because when we did this analysis, we weren't too sure what was going to come out. And we're like, these are actually some pretty high numbers. Like we're in the billions of dollars here. So uh, what does this mean? And two assessments that we had that were uh, quite readily available for comparison was that we looked at all on and off-road diesel vehicles. So this is like, you know, your big trucks from Alberta, but also your construction vehicles, the whole, the whole gamut. $5.5 billion is what that is. So wildfire smoke is we're on the same par. And then same thing if you look at all on and off-road gasoline vehicles. So this is like all our motor vehicles. Um, I think also captures uh, lawnmowers, the gas lawnmowers is part of that, and other off-road um, gasoline engines, so 7.3 billion. So again, again, we're in the same ballpark. And uh, the US EPA did a similar analysis using their um, modeling techniques and their equivalent, their version of, not equivalent, their analogous um, ACBAT. And 
they did that for the continental US and they got about 10 times higher for their dollar values, which is expected because they have about 10 times higher population. So if you sort of put on that scale, um, it, it made sense. Although they're, if anyone's curious, I can have a conversation that the wildfire smoke is quite different for the US compared to us because they do a lot more prescribed burning and agricultural burning than we do, but they also have um, a lot more population that can be impacted, say, especially in the Southeast uh, US. And so one of the things I always found really interesting with this, because we had quite regional variability. And so I, one of the things I wanted to do was like, is there a way we can look at the regional variability that is meaningful, informative, interesting? So I thought, how about we look at the top 10 most impacted census divisions? We looked at acute um, exposure mortality, because again, that's that seasonal idea. So across our, our years of analysis, and we're like, what were your, what was our top 10 impacted census divisions? So we're not surprised, right? We got Vancouver, the so large population center, you know, in an exposure zone. Calgary, Edmonton, again, larger population centers in areas frequently um, uh, that are in wildfire, you know, relative proximity. The rest of them, these uh, four, five, six through nine are all other uh, census divisions in BC in the interior. Again, you can see some of these exposures, right? So Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, 1.5, 1.3 exposure, but Okanagan, 3.1, uh, Okanagan, um, similicamine, uh, 4.4. If you look at caribou, 5.3 micrograms per meter cubed was their average exposure over that time. Surprise, surprise, Toronto. So really, and Toronto's exposure, 0.2. So this is the value of the true black bat is that you have a small exposure. This is our lower end threshold. Um, and that when you hit a census division with like 7 million people or something like that in it, you end up with uh, it coming out in the act bat. So really this, as it's labeled here, basically what we're saying is like, this is really the impact of the long range transport, that it is, you know, a national issue now. I've always I've been saying this for a while and the 2023 happened and fires were coast to coast to coast and every province was impacted, you know, uh, with sort of an experience that Western Canada is more familiar with, uh, but, you know, it does it does bear out. So with that in mind, our future plans. So Health Canada has a whole group dedicated to doing a lot of work on wildfire smoke in the air program. And we're continuing to look at what are the health effects of wildfire smoke to help us understand, you know, what is the full gamut, you know, understanding more about the reproductive developmental effects, potentially some neurological effects. Um, so it really helps to strengthen our evidence base uh, for identifying disproportionately impacted populations, for really helping us to target our risk communications and our communications materials, and really for development of effective mitigation strategies uh, and risk, um, risk mitigation strategies. And uh, so, Part of the analysis, I didn't go into the specifics of, is that we used uh, for the analysis, it was based off of the association that's known for ambient PM in general. So that's PM from all sources, those associations between your changing exposure and your risk of mortality. Ideally, it would be really neat if we had wildfire specific ones. So we could really say this is specifically for wildfires. This is the association and have um, more accurate numbers. Not that we think our numbers are inaccurate, but it is a limitation that we're applying what we have as the best available evidence to a specific source. So the best available evidence from all sources to a specific source. And the million dollar question, as I like to call it. So collaborate with ECCC to look at the health burden for 2019 to 2023. So I used to joke all the time that I've been working on wildfires for like five, six years and no one's ever cared. And then last spring happened. And the whole summer, I was very busy. Uh, shout out to Rashini. She was a ton of support as I did uh, interviews on national news and uh, the, the Atlantic called me for an interview. So very, very busy uh, doing that. And this has always been on the books to look at another five years of analysis. And so uh, we're lots of people very interested in this. And also now we'll have from 2013 to 2023, and we can have a better sense of the chronic idea. Like look at that, what is the average exposure over those 10 years? as opposed to like thinking of chronic as if I had that same year over and over and over again, what is more a 10 year average exposure? What are the chronic health effects of that as a way uh, to be, I, I'd say more accurate, more precise. And that leads me to my acknowledgements. So I'm here presenting, I got the travel approval, but it's a large team back at Health Canada who's all part of that. And same with uh, Environment Canada, our great collaborators there. And Sarah Henderson from BCCDC also uh, contributed to the paper. And you can ask me if you have any questions, but there's also the generic air inbox. And thank you. So I'm Sarah's telling me she's sure people will have questions. Yeah. Is there a couple of questions there? 
I'll move away from here. Any questions? Oh, oh, yeah, I was sure. I wasn't sure. Melanie, is your hand up? Oh, no, okay. I know. The whole presentation, I was like, she asked me questions. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, great dad joke to start with. <laughs> I'll add that to my repertoire. Um, I'm glad you touched on the concentration response functions. I was curious if you have a good feel for how accurate they may be. Like these come from like epidemiological studies, do they? Yeah, so let me go backwards. So we have fairly decent, um, we don't think it's too big of a stretch. I'm gonna try and get back to that slide. Maybe, maybe not, uh, right there. So the studies that those concentration response functions are derived from are ones that consider ambient exposure from mm. all sources. Wildfire smoke is one of the leading sources, right? right so, okay. so it's like our top three were transportation, wildfire smoke and home heating. So, and they accounted for like close to 60, 70% in the Meng paper. So it is a, it doesn't seem like too much of a stretch. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I'm just curious, like with, with wildfires, I guess, depending on where they burn as well, what the PM oh, content may be, like if there's, there's airborne like metals and things like that, that's. So there's a zillion factors that go into like what is in the wildfire smoke, what is the exact constituents components? Is it flaming versus smoldering? Interesting right. one, flaming actually produces less PM 2.5, but when we go to put it out, it goes to a smoldering state, which produces way more PM 2.5. Uh, whether there's a hardwood, whether there's so a softwood, whether they have their PPE on, whether they got your PPE yeah. on, yeah. Um, <laughs> your like, uh, what type, like hardwood versus softwood, uh, like a bunch of studies comes out of Australia. So like burning eucalyptus, yeah. like how is that versus say like um, sage grass in the States, you know, is it a crown fire? Is it this, what is the temperature conditions? What is the relative humidity? Yeah, like it's, you name it, it impacts what is in the smoke. Yeah. Great question. You asked the same you the question? More or less? Okay. Hello. Uh, I have a question. What kind of models did they use uh, to model the uh, chemical transport of the PM 2.5? Well, I'm great that Melissa's here in case there's more detailed questions asked on this. <laughs> but uh, so it's um, GEMMAC. So this is also uh, anyone from ECCC will know that this is a little bit dated now. So because GEMMAC used to be the everyday model that Environment Canada runs. And so it has all the atmospheric chemistry in it, meteorological processes. And in, because the domain that gets modeled includes Canada, US and Mexico, all of those sources are put in there. And then firework used to be a sort of this add-on that they would add on top of GEMMAC. And so Firework uses, they get uh, information from, it's called CFIS, it's a Canadian wildfire information satellite that looks at the hotspots and the burned area, and then they know the emission rates, and they're able to put that all into the model. Um, and then it goes on top, so it's plugged into GEMMAC, and they used to just run it during the wildfire season, but now Firework is run all year round because it's just built into GEMMAC and they're not two separate two separate runs. Does that help? So it's not a global model. No, it's, it's just, um, okay. yeah, like this is this is most of the modeling domain. I think there's probably more because it gets all the way into Mexico, but we don't show Mexico in uh, in the results here. Because I, I I work with uh, GeoScan and it's like a global model that is good for uh, something like this. I would say. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you for your answer. No problem. Great, it, thank you. E triple C, did I pass? <laughs> <laughs> and there's also copies did of I, your slide deck and your yeah. uh, books there, and you can contact. I think I think our collaborators, our, to give an our colleagues there? from E triple C, might have more info for us. Uh, well, I just say that there's the GeoSchem model itself is part of a consortium of of kind of the modeling community, and there's inner comparisons between those groups, and they share kind of development. Uh, they're part of a development community and in a comparison community on the modeling side. Uh, the problem with wildfires is like this is a real time forecast system. So most of the emissions inventories that drive the geoschem might be more less real time than what we need for public predictions. So I think it, it's important for the path forward and how to better model these and where the impacts are and how the smoke goes aloft or at the surface, those sort of things. But and it's good for for studying, there may be, um, might be details in the models themselves that might differ a bit, but in general, I think this gives us a good measure of where smoke happened and that's far better than we were a few years ago. So 
Um, a lot of thanks to the modeling community for bringing that to an operational status. Yeah, and just to add on, um, our, like ECCC does a lot of uh, science and research and development to continually improve firework to make it better, better predictive. And uh, we're definitely betting for it, betting for it from our side because we're getting more precise and more accurate uh, predictions or estimates for our analysis. Thank you very much. <laughs> your lung buddy and my lung buddy. And now your other practice you might not be able to Oh, it's okay. I paid for my bag. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I was gonna <laughs> Actually, I wrote on the jar of honey first, 100 grams, and I was like, "Do you think you get this? Do you feel like cancer?" And they're like, "No." <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so next, continuing on the wildfire zones, I'd like to introduce Melissa McDonald, who is a program meteorologist within the Meteorological S Service of Canada. Environment and Climate Change Canada's Health and Air Quality Forecast Services Program. That's a really long title. <laughs> Melissa is the program lead for extreme temperatures with years of experience within the program, including air quality. Part of her role is to collaborate with multiple levels of government in public health and emergency services to support their program needs and balance them with the capacities of the MSCECCC forecasting and alerting. So with that, I would like to introduce Melissa McDonald, who's going to talk about national overview of the 2023 wildfire season and upcoming changes. Thank you. thank you, Sarah. And I'll just say thank you to Sarah for managing to fit us in. We had a little bit of a confusion over who would let know, Sarah know that we were, wanted to present from our program. And then I'll also start by saying that this presentation is not mine. It's my colleague's presentation. So I'd like to thank Selena Dett, Sherry Williams, and Kathleen Young, who actually were the ones that presented on all these materials recently within our program or within the MSC. And I'm just going to try and do an okay job of it. <laughs> all right, let's figure out how to go forward. Okay. So mainly, I'm going to talk about the wildfire season of 2023. And I have a bunch of slides to detail what kind of season it was. And I'm going to go through them really fast, and then I'm going to go on to some updates you guys need to hear. So 2023, was it the worst season ever? Once again, it was. It was definitely the worst wildfire season again after 2014, after 2017, after 2018, after 2021. Unfortunately, climate change and wildfire is here. Um, so a little bit of information. We had 887 AQ alert days. We just, this is a calculation we'd use. 867 of them were from wildfire. This count was of the end of October, um, but that's pretty sig significant. Um, we had long range transport that was already talked about for sure. And we're finding better ways to be able to show you guys all about what's happened over the wildfire season. So that's what my next few slides are about. So. One project that we had done recently, we talked an awful lot about, um, was to look at comparisons of our air quality health index values. So AQHI can be from one to 10 plus, and we measure this at 120 communities. And this is the comparison between 2022, which is, was a rather minimal wildfire activity year in 2023, which was the most active wildfire season on record. <laughs> and so the distribution scales are not exactly the same. Oh, these ones are, sorry. Um, but you can see it's a distribution of what were the AQHI levels from one to 10. And it's really hard to see because we see so many levels at the lower values. Think of all those great air quality days for many locations. But over here, we definitely have 10 plus existing. And there was no 10 plus existing in 2022. Figure out the light. Yeah, there we go. Um, another way of looking at it is to look at just four to 10 plus, which is where you're actually seeing your moderate to high values of AQHI. And here's a distribution comparing 2021, 2022, and 2023. Some highlights are that in 2023, there was 7,261 hours of 10 plus AQHI, 629 in 2022, 1,800 in 2021. So that's significant. And you can really see, oh, oh, I did the wrong button the 10 plus showing up here in 2023. Um, so Trace is going to go into more of this, and so is Stephanie. <laughs> but we do have a small sensor pilot program, and we did use those small sensor um, small sensors to also look at the distribution um, of 
where we saw what was considered to be 10 plus AQHI or concentrations of 100 micrograms per meter cubed. I say 10 plus AQHI because that's our equivalent with our AQHI plus for PM 2.5. And we can see right across the board that we saw that happening for sure in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Quebec. And oh, yes, of course, let's not forget Northwest Territories because I think it was their season actually. Um, so thank you very much to all of those that contributed on this uh, slide. If I go too long, we'll run out of time. <laughs> Um, also variability. So I know that Carlin touched on this too, like it, it, there's definitely variability in how much um, PM 2.5 we see across the, the country or from year to year with wildfire seasons. And this is just a map showing that similar variability. Um, and you can see right here in 2023 where the concentrations were in Quebec and then Northern Alberta, Northwest Territories. Um, once again, the contributions we can get from the US. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you can see right here. Um, yeah. And then listen, it, this also shows that the number of fires does not necessarily dictate the amount of, um, sorry, the area burned does not necessarily dictate the um, wildfire emissions that we see as well. Um, so also we talk about special air quality statement days or SAQS days. Um, these are maps that are showing how many days um, there was a special air quality statement in effect um, by forecast regions of the areas we issue alerts over. Um, so it's a comparison we, as we've been doing to last year, 2022, and then this year, 2023. These maps are done across the fiscal year, but more or less the majority of our special air quality statements are caused by wildfire. So you can think of them as being 2022 to 2023, but I will highlight that 2022 shows the entire year, 2023 only showed up to the end of September, <laughs> all right? So we can see here significant numbers creeping up into the Northern Prairies um, and Southern Northwest Territories. And then this is just on scene in Quebec. This has never happened. Um, we can see too, there were 919 air quality alerts in um, 2022. There were 4,677 air quality alerts in um, 2023. And then I have a map that shows you all the way back to 2000, um, the fiscal year 2018-19, right up to this year. And you can see where it highlights some. Um, back in 2018 was a big year. Um, and 2022 does seem pretty, or sorry, 2021 was fairly active as well um, as a highlight. And the scales are the same, but note that I had to add um, pink here in 2023 to highlight that we've gone above 100 or well we did have 100 plus before but we never reached it in all of them so. <laughs> um and then also just thinking about the workload that this takes on and how much um inquiries happen carlin um definitely alluded to this there was multiple questions like never before from media interest from the public our partners and so here's just a highlight of some of those things um this map or graph over here shows how many air quality alert bulletins were issued by year, starting with 2017, which was a bigger year as well. So orange is 2023. And that's how many air quality alert bulletins we issued. Um, so 4,677 of them. Um, this was also, of course, smog warnings, which we use in Quebec. Um, and then this is an increase of 60%. Um, for May and 74% for June as compared to the entire record from 2017 to 2022. Um, so it really started off quite early this year as well. Um, 668 media calls, seven media technical briefings, 230 media requests. Um, and then there was updates and lots of support from our Health Canada colleagues, Rashini being one of them in particular to get um, updated information out there on our web pages um, and just guidance and more support material for everyone to use. Um, so that was the wildfire season it was. <laughs> now what are we going to do about it? Um, so a lot of this alluded to there being a lot more um, of AQHI of 10 plus um, this year. And how are we going to let the public know that this was an even worse um, position than necessarily just our AQHI of, 10 to, of 7 to 10? Um, so moving into our 2024 season, we have decided to make some changes. 
Um, so we're gonna create a two tiered alerting system. We're gonna continue to use our spiritual air quality statements when the AQHI is about seven to 10. Um, it's a little flexible sometimes, uh, especially air quality statements are issued at even a six. And then we're gonna use something new called an air quality advisory. And that's gonna be issued when um, the AQHI is expected to be a 10 plus. Um, and the point of this, sorry, I missed my it's AQA, we know, is that it will be issued for wildfire smoke events only during the summer when the AQHI is a 10 plus. Um, it'll display as a red on our alert map, if anyone's familiar with the battle board, as we might call it, but where you see your weather alerts on our weather.gc.ca. Um, and then also as now, and their special air quality statement is gray for reference. Um, and then it'll also be red banner on your uh, weather can app. Um, the idea here is to the alert the public that the air quality could have more severe health effects than just a special air quality statement. And there'll be associated messaging that'll provide stronger wording um, to show that the conditions are worsening. The idea here is that we're hoping this will um, entice, um, create public organizations, group organized activities to actually cancel their events. And that is the real goal. Um, and then also, um, we have looked a little bit at the data. We're going to prevent flip-flopping between the special air quality statement and the air quality advisory. Um, and we're going to talk with forecasters to encourage this not to happen. And it also will help with workload. We don't want them switching back and forth. Um, and then also, this aligns with a lot of the work that we are doing towards Rick's tier alerting that is going to come on board in the future. And then also, we have another change. And I so enjoyed the fact that Carlin got into the models because that's exactly what this one's about. Um, so we have uh, currently have two air quality pages where you can um, see our um, air quality modeling. And this is the for air quality forecast model. Um, one is our standard air quality model, as um, exactly as Carolyn described, it shows the three pollutants under GEMMAC, as she called it. And then the other is our firework model. And I don't need to go into the history here, but this was a great slide. I thought I sort of put it through up there. Moving forward, we're going to have a united air quality forecast model. Um, so this is going to include mean that firework um, runs directly in, there is no separate firework, but it runs directly within um, the regional air quality uh, deterministic prediction system. <laughs> anyway, and so what that means is, what it means to all you, and the reason I'm telling you in particular is that there'll be one web page, one web page to go to, to look at your air quality model information. It's also gonna be simplified um, to make it easier for partners and public um, that are looking just for that air quality information. Um, and um, we will provide more information as it comes forward. Um, we have chosen the current firework page because that's the most familiar. That's usually what the public goes to to receive that information because they're interested in wildfire smoke usually. Um, we're gonna make it simpler as I mentioned. And then we will also, this will include total PM 2.5 and then also of course our ozone and NO2. Um, so that's the plan. And um, if you're interested in where to go when you want to look for the wildfire smoke um, come the summer, you want to go to your regular firework webpage and you will find it there. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more communication put forward with it. Um, but nothing will change with the background modeling. It's just a change of how the system is running underneath. Um, and then I would just like to highlight um, our team, of course, I mentioned some of them already. Um, but that we had had some changes and I know if many of you may have known Mike cow our great manager for many years but Mike retired this fall and now Celine our uh, air quality lead has become our acting manager. Um, and then I've listed everybody else so that you can see there we've also lost a couple of other employees, but we've definitely gained some great ones and then also just to highlight a few upcoming projects. Um, so under air quality, we will be moving to air quality forecasts in a map view. Um, so right within uh, our say our uh, within our weather.gca gca.ca pages, um, the small sensor pilot is def is also moving into a program, and I'll leave for Tracy to talk more about small sensors too. Um, in terms of extreme temperatures, which is really where I I fit in, um, we're going to have temperature notifications on the WeatherCan app. So if you're familiar with the WeatherCan app right now, you know that you have AQHI, 
um, notifications. We will also have notifications coming on board for temperature. So you can um, choose your maximum minimum temperature value, humid X high or wind chill low, and be able to be notified of when those happen. I will highlight that it will work a little different than air quality. Um, you will not be able to set different thresholds based on your location because there's just too many combinations to come up with in terms of temperature. We couldn't handle that level. So one set of thresholds, all okay. Um, and also we're planning an extreme temperature forum in late fall or early winter um, this coming year. And then also in our UV side, um, there is a small UV sensor pilot um, developing to support our model verification and nav casting technologies. And that's everything that I had. This is a question from Zoom. The figures showing concentrations across Canada were largely blank or gray in the north. Is that due to fewer data sources? Are there efforts to improve that coverage? Oh, um, is the question related to this map? So I'll just highlight it. If it was related to this map, um, we have very limited forecast regions in the north and though you can't see them we do point forecasts of locations because it's where the population is located say within northern uh, quebec labrador and the um territories i feel like this might be it but let me go further back <laughs> i feel like that was the map i feel like that's the map yeah yeah okay <laughs> all right <laughs> I am going to ask Melissa a question. <laughs> well, maybe more of a comment. I will say that the the maps are great, but um, I do think they might underrepresent a little bit how different our wildfire season has been in Atlantic for the past couple of years, and that might need to be improved in some way, because I think it's hard to use the same scale as what's going on in BC for us, but we still have to know what happened in the past couple of years has been significantly different. Great point, Andrew. And maybe I'll just flip here to show where you can see that it is significantly different and highlight one thing on these maps. We've recently taken an approach of being more clear to forecasters about when we want special air quality statements issued, um, especially in Atlantic Canada. If you're familiar, since you're from here, we used to issue special air quality statements even to talk about just, you know, smoke aloft, just to sort of detail why you were seeing smoke, even if you weren't seeing um, higher AQHI values at the ground level and now we're pushing for it to be more related to aqhi so i can't compare back to 2020 when i say this right of course because we do see blue here and here and i suspect in many cases they were nothing compared to what we experienced this summer and then also the same year in 2021 but we have a darker blue here <laughs> and it's really hard to see on these maps all the other ones and it, it does correspond with five to six or ten to fourteen days um, 10 to 14 days down in the Shelburne area, which is quite shocking and drastic for us in Atlanta, Canada. Trace is going to go more into the, the event for sure. But yeah, Andrew's right. You're very clear. Maybe I'll do just an Atlantic version and try and think about which AQHI was associated with. Yeah. So. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Great, thank you. And probably what we'll do is we'll do the other ones and then if you have any questions, and maybe just Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm glad we were able to fit you onto the schedule. So next we have Tracy Talbot and Tracy is a health and air quality program supervisor with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Tracy started as a meteorologist with ECCC in 2002 and has worked as a forecaster at both the Newfoundland and Labrador Weather Office in Gander, Newfoundland and the Atlantic Storm Prediction Center in Dartmouth. Since 2017, Tracy has been overseeing the ECC heat, cold and air quality forecast programs for the four Atlantic provinces, working closely with operational forecasters, as well as collaborating with national program leads and provincial health and air quality partners. And Tracy is the Health and Air Quality Program Supervisor, Environment and Climate Change Canada. 
and is going to speak to us on an overview of the Nova Scotia fires of 2023 with a closer look at the use of small centers. So welcome, Trace. Yes, thank you for that introduction. Um, I know a lot of the faces out there and they may know the role that I play, but for the most part, I just, I want you all to realize that my, for the, I really focus my job working with the forecasters in the weather office in both the Dartmouth office and in uh, the, the um, Gander um, weather office. And we look after the air quality forecasts for the Atlantic region. Now, but in that job, in that role, I also collaborate quite frequently, as was mentioned, with not only our national lead, um, like program leads like Melissa and Celine Odette, but also with uh, Health Canada colleagues, and especially with our Nova Scotia air quality partners, um, like Stephanie, who's going to speak next. And those relationships, whenever there's any kind of event that comes up locally, those relationships are really key in get keeping things moving and information passing along smoothly. Um, but before I get into the fire itself, um, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of a background on what we do at Environment Canada and from the forecast office. We not only do we put out um, weather forecasts like for public and marine, but we also do some air quality forecasts. So like one of the main bulletins that we do is the AQH5 forecast bulletin. And um, to do that, we use the monitoring data of NO2, ozone, and PM2.5 that the province provides, and we calculate the AQHI from those components. And we do that for, in Nova Scotia, it's for seven different point locations across the province, um, but there's also nine different point locations in New Brunswick, three in PEI, and another six in Newfoundland. Um, that's basically like it's a two-day forecast. Uh, it's issued twice daily. And it just indicates the highest AQHI that's expected in those point locations. Now, during wildfires um, season, the AQHI calculations are not just done using these three components. In the background, there's another side calculation that's done, and it's using just the PM 2.5. And for uh, during the wildfire season, it's the higher of these two calculations that the public sees. So if you go and look at your, find your forecast, if there's smoke in the air, the AQHI is gonna be based predominantly on that, um, the, the PM 2.5 concentration at that time. Um, another bulletin that the forecasters will issue, and um, Melissa alluded to it, is a special air quality statement. Um, here in Atlantic Canada, we actually, the forecasters have SOPs that um, they will issue the special air quality statement whenever it's an AQHI is six or higher. These uh, special air quality statements are actually is issued for public forecast regions, not just those point locations that the AQHI bulletin goes out for. So this is like a, a public region bulletin. Um, so usually these special air quality statements um, are in the Atlantic region, especially we have usually pretty good air quality. So most of it is from long distance transport of smoke. When we can see those plumes coming from, from out west, from Quebec, that's when these special air quality statement bulletins are often issued. But another time that we will use them is to provide the public some information regarding local events. Now, the problem is that we often don't have a lot of observations happening around these local events. So we rely on interaction with some of our local our colleagues with um, with the province, like EMOs, some of our health contacts, and the the warning preparedness meteorologist who works integrated with them on a regular basis. So we provide, so we rely on information that we gather from them to issue these special air quality bulletins. And you'll notice too that um, the blue section of the um, I don't know if I can do it here. The blue section here of this the example that part is more of a free format that the forecasters can can put in their bulletin to kind of indicate um, what the issue is, what to expect, when the situation may clear up, um, that kind of thing. And also included here, um, amended, like appended to each one of these special air quality statements is some predetermined um, call to action statements and impact statements that have been um, approved by Health Canada. And um, they're always included at the bottom of these special air quality statements. So, and as um, Melissa mentioned, 
upcoming this coming season, we are hopeful to have those air quality alerts that the forecasters can issue when that AQHI of 10 plus actually is expected. So that's there will be an additional bulletin um, that the forecasters will be responsible for, and they will show up as red on the city pages and that kind of thing on our forecasts. Now, to do our, the forecast, the, for, they, the forecasters themselves rely on some of the um, air quality forecast models that, that they have at their fingertips, one of them being the firework model. Um, and the firework model includes the atmospheric chemistry, but meteorological processes, as well as the wildfire emissions, as was discussed. And um, these models are really good at tracking those plumes from, that come from the wildfires from out west. Now, when a, a more of a local event happens, the another tool that we have is the atmospheric transport and dispersion models. Um, they're a bit more higher resolution. They work a little bit better and they're more available a little bit more quickly um, because they, they are run more frequently. Um, they are just transport and dispersion models, but the forecasters can use them to get an idea of when there's a local event, like a local wildfire, where those plumes are gonna go. Now, there is some limitations with both of these models, of course, and one of them for the forecasters is that um, both of the, these models rely on the initialization of, of, of hot spots. The, there's polar orbiting satellites that actually have to identify these hot spots in order to have them integrated into the model. And if there's any kind of cloud cover or um, it's the, the fires are being obscured by a lot of smoke, those hot spots may not be captured well, and it may not be incorporated as well as desired into these models. So really forecasters rely on a lot of on the ground observations in order to verify a lot of the conditions. So getting now towards last spring, um, as Melissa mentioned, nationwide, uh, it was a bad wildfire season, but that in Nova Scotia, uh, it was the exact same thing. Um, it was a record breaking year. We, it, throughout the season, we, there was over 220 wildfires and it impacted over 25,000 hectares in Nova Scotia alone. Leading into the wildfire season last year, um, it was really dry from about February, about this time of year, through till May. Areas in through central and southwestern Nova Scotia actually only got about 30 to 60% of the normal precipitation in those areas. And then leading into May and in the last week or so in May, Nova, Sc Nova Scotia actually experienced some really warm temperatures up above 27 degrees in some areas. And it was really dry. The dew point was really low during that time. So ultimately what happened, one of the first big fires to break out was the Barrington Lake, Lake Fire in Shelburne County. And this fire started on Saturday, May 27th, um, and it ended up growing quite significantly and it impacted over 23,000 hectares, and which is the largest wildfire in Nova Scotia recorded history. Um, it resulted in the evacuation of over 6,000 residents down on the, along the Southwest shore and um, at least 60 homes and structures were damaged from that fire. The following day, the Tantalan fire in Halifax County broke out and it was significantly smaller, but it was in much more urban area. So it, it, the, it impacted about 800 hectares, but it re resulted in the evacuation of over 14,000 residents in that area. And at least 150 homes and structures were damaged in that fire. So you can see here, you can see the plume. This is a, pit, a satellite image taken on Sunday, but you can see the two plumes happening pretty much at the same time um, um, on that Sunday late afternoon. So of course, um, we need to, we forecasters want to know what's going on. Um, prior to the fire, we had, as we, I mentioned, we had those um, observation sites that the province takes uh, observations of ozone, PM 2.5 and, and NO2 um, across the province. There's four of them that are typically located in mainland Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, at the time of the fire, the one in downtown Halifax was kind of out of commission because it was roof work being done at the site. So it had been taken offline like a, a month or so before to get that wor roof work done. Um, so really, in the location of these two plumes, we really only had the one official site in um, Lake Major 
to, to kind of keep an eye on the smoke. So, but luckily, you can see all these other, there was about 15 other small sensors positioned around the province that the forest casters had access to the, the observations coming from those sites. And that provided PM 2.5 observations um, in, like, for, for the, those locations. So, but you can see there wasn't a lot of even the small sensors in some of the areas. So first thing Monday morning, of course, right after the fire started, um, there was a, we had a team call <laughs> and partners in Health Canada, the province, us, the air, the air quality science group, we all had a call and we were like, what options do we have for extra sensors having getting them um, de deployed? Um, Health Canada is the, the one we usually go to for the emergency sensors and they're the ones that, that started that, um, that acquisition of additional sensors. Uh, luckily, the um, air quality science group located in Dartmouth had a few sensors on hand at that time and they were able to provide them to the province who um, were able to get them out and distributed. So what happened is within the next 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, I suppose, we had an additional seven sensors that were, were positioned in, by our, our provincial colleagues um, around HRM and then in the Southwest Shore area here. And then within the next few days after that, Health Canada was able to install a few more. So it really helped the, um, the, the sensor network and our observations that were available not only to um, decision makers in the municipalities, but also to the forecasters and making their forecast decisions for special air quality statements, that kind of thing. So this is a, just a quick example of some of the observations that came out of, of from those sensors. Now you can see here up in the, the right hand corner, Lake Major, that was the official ob center that we had. And it did, the smoke obviously was captured here for a little while, but it wasn't in the thick of things. Um, the other, there's a couple other sites without the stars here. They uh, were already there prior to the, the fires, but the two sites here with the stars, they were put in place um, immediately after the fire started. And you can really see the spikes um, uh, that the, in the data that shows exactly how kind of uh, the, the impact that the PM 2.5 had in those areas. Same thing down in the Southwest shore. Um, there was a few sites that were there previously. Those are the ones without the stars, but there was a couple of extra sensors put in in place. I mean, this sorry here, there was a couple extra sensors that were put in place, and this doesn't show all of them, obviously. But you can see here this new site, the sensor that was put in Lockport. They were in um, extreme AQHI values or extreme, extreme PM two point five um, values for days. And uh, it was, it was, they were under a special air quality statement, I believe, for almost two weeks. So throughout the event, um, the small sensors for the forecasters were vital. Um, we didn't have a lot of observations outside of those uh, small sensors, those purple layers that we had access to. And they were very important in determining the geographical extent and how bad it was um, in those in in their different public forecast regions. Now, between May 28th and June 9th, the Atlantic Storm Prediction Center, so the weather office here in Dartmouth, they actually actually issued 77 special air quality statement bulletins related to the smoke, and that extended from forecast regions all the way from Yarmouth up through Sydney County. Um, there was, like I mentioned, there was some areas that actually uh, experienced PM 2.5 or AQH, really high AQHI values um, of 10 plus for not only hours at a time, but in some cases days at a time. And that was really located right in close proximity to the fires. But even further away from the fires, um, there was AQHI values of four to six experienced all the way throughout much of Nova Scotia and even into southwestern, um, sorry, southeastern uh, Newfoundland. Um, that's where I'm going to end now because the, it's the province that is really the knowledgeable ones when it comes to these small sensors. 
and it, it's because of the work we do with them that allows us to do our work well, as well as we can, but it's, it's this collaboration with the, the partners and, and with Health Canada getting those, uh, those extra sensors out that allowed us to really get a good grasp on what was happening during this event. I'm sure we all have questions. Thank you so much, Tracy. Next, I'd like to introduce Stephanie McDougall. Uh, she has BSc in Environmental Science, is the Supervisor of the Air Quality Monitoring and Reporting Team within the Air Quality Unit at Nova Scotia Environment and Climate Change. Stephanie's responsibilities include the administration of departmental air quality monitoring and reporting programs. This includes overseeing the operation of the Provincial Ambient Air Monitoring Network, as well as additional requirements for air quality monitoring, such as emergency response in the province. She also represents the province on the National Air Pollution Surveillance Managers Committee. So today she's going to talk to us about an overview of the process and challenges of obtaining and installing the small sensors. So please welcome Stephanie McDougall. And then we'll ask questions to everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie McDougall. Um, there's gonna be a little bit of repetition of what Tracy said as well, but just kind of going and drilling a little further down into our experience as a province during these events um, that were, as we've discussed, quite unprecedented in, in our province. Um, so as we were discussing, as Tracy mentioned, there were extreme weather and drought conditions in the spring leading up to these events that happened. And along with the Barrington Lake fire that went on and also the Tantalan fire, there were also a couple more events that happened kind of in the municipality um, that we ran into. Uh, one was a fire on the Johnston building roof where, coincidentally, we normally have PM monitors set up. Um, but of course, in the most worst timing ever, they were off of the roof for a roofing project that was happening. Uh, and we also had the burning down of the Wag Waltic Club in the south end of the um, city as well. Uh, so these events highlighted the importance of having near real-time localized PM 2.5 air monitoring, specifically around these wild, wildfire events. Uh, and during this uh, event, as Tracy said, we recognize that all air monitors only determine what is happening at their specific location, which highlighted uh, spatial coverage gaps in our permanent air monitoring network that we have when people were looking for that very localized information and particulate data. Um, we also discovered during this event that having updated websites and consistent messaging are very important when um, the data and messaging are coming from all different places. And also that the effects of the wildfire smokes are and were felt far beyond our borders. Um, so just a few images. Uh, this slide shows some images from um, this eventful time period. The top left is that uh, fire that happened at the Wag Waltic Club in the south end of Halifax. Uh, top middle is the fire on the Johnston roof in downtown Halifax, where our permanent station is usually located. Um, these two are from the Shelburne County fires. The middle is uh, just a nice illustration of the special air quality statements that were put out at the time. And the bottom left is a photo in Tantalan during the event. Also, these are some, oh, these are some uh, just kind of news articles and images that are showing um, kind of that the fires were going beyond our borders. Uh, there were lots of news articles from New Hampshire and New Jersey and photos from New York. And there was, this is the special air quality statement that came from Newfoundland at the time. And the next few slides, I'm just going to do a quick overview of our permanent uh, ambient air quality monitoring network. Uh, starting at top left, that's an example of one of our stations that's in Sydney, which is probably under snow right now. Um, so this top right photo is are the instruments that are normally on the roof of the Johnston building, and they are all different types of PM monitors. Um, bottom right here is a map that actually shows our air zones as well as our air monitoring. 
And the bottom left is actually a picture of inside of one of our stations. That's the Lake Major station where we were actually able to get data, PM data from our FEM monitor during the event. And our ambient air quality monitoring network functions under a partnership with Environment and Climate Change Canada under the National Air Pollution Surveillance Program. Uh, the goal of this program is to provide accurate and consistent and long-term air quality data of a uniform standard across the country. So it includes partners from all provinces and territories and a couple municipalities. Um, and that is what our network runs under. Uh, that network includes, as Tracy said, seven air quality sites across the province. We also have one acid precipitation monitoring site in Sherbrooke. Um, at these stations, we monitor for PM 2.5, um, NOx, NO, NO2, ozone, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide. Uh, at one station, we do total reduced sulfur, um, VOCs at that Johnston station, and also acid precipitation. Now, at all seven of these provincial stations, we have uh, FEM, PM 2.5 monitors. Uh, also, currently at all of these seven sites, we are co locating those purple air sensors that Tracy was talking about. Now, the data that comes from all of these instruments is shared publicly in near real time. Um, one of the locations that this data is shared is on our dedicated uh, provincial data website, which this is a photo of. Um, and this data is updated hourly. Uh, important to note that this hourly data is not validated just to a minimal standard. Um, but you can also download historical data that is validated from this website and also from our provincial open data website. Now, data from these stations are also used, as Tracy said, um, to inform current observations as well as forecasted AQHI. And these are two locations where you can find that information, which is the ECCC website and also the Weather Can app. Now, a little bit about um, some successes and challenges during this event. Um, after that initial meeting with our partners, we had identified that those FEM monitors that we had um, weren't providing adequate spatial coverage to provide the data needed to make hyperlocal decisions during the wildfire event. Uh, with the swift generosity of our partners at ECCC and Health Canada between Monday and Friday, I guess, May 29th to June 2nd, we were able to install 14 additional of those purple air sensors in the central and western portions of the province. These two maps just kind of show from the beginning of the week to the end of the week, the difference in the spatial coverage. Um, while not as precise and reliable as these FEM instruments, purple airs have been extensively tested by ECCC and the US EPA and many other groups. And they've been found to be useful in helping to fill these spatial gaps for PM 2.5 monitoring during wildfire events. This is just uh, kind of putting those maps that uh, Tracy was showing all on in one place so you can again see as the week went on the spatial more spatial coverage that was put in place. Uh, initially, it happened like after that meeting, as Tracy said, Lucy was kind of like, well, we have eight of those sitting here and so anyway, thanks to Cody and to Jeremy and to Lee, who spent that week driving all over the province installing, installing these sensors. Lee got to see parts of the province that even I haven't seen, and I've lived here for 12 years. <laughs> and also, as Tracy showed, um, this is the PM 2.5 data that was collected during these events. That larger graph over on the left shows the data that came from our FEM monitors that were operating at six of our stations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can see that Lake Major Peak. There was the uh... But you can also see how, as the week went on, um, the smoke was transported across the province as well. Uh, the rest of the graphs show the data from those purple airs. And this additional data was now available to assist all parties in making more localized decisions whether it was individuals or municipalities or the ECCC forecasters. Um, 
and we were able to do more localized AQHI forecasts and localized special air quality statements. I would say that one of the biggest successes that from our experience was drawing on those existing relationships, as Tracy again mentioned, and new relationships and just the great collaboration that happened to get things happening as quickly as possible. So with Environment Canada, um, Health Canada, our Nova Scotia um, Environmental Health Group, our Air Quality Unit, um, our Provincial Health and Wellness Department, and also EMO, uh, with the help of these additional data from the Purple Airs, we were able to collaborate with ECCC and EMO on more uh, localized language for special air quality statements and uh, other health and air quality related messaging. We were able to draw from past experiences and to draw on other jurisdictions. There's been a lot of discussion on how this, this was a new thing, not new, but at this level, it was a new thing for our province. So um, looking to the experience of the Western provinces um, and having them help with health messaging as well. And again, these are just some examples of those places where we were able to use that additional data to do more localized messaging. And of course, there were some challenges as well. Um, one of those was like initially identifying and clarifying the roles and responsibilities and linkages between departments and levels of government and outside partners. Uh, luckily, there were some existing relationships there already. So if one group didn't know the right person to talk to, someone else did. Um, and in those conversations, that recognition that air monitors do only determine that what is happening at that specific location and that gaps in coverage sometimes result in a disconnect between what AQHI is reporting and what is happening on the ground locally, especially in Nova Scotia, where we have a lot of rural areas and we have seven stations and it's covering a whole large area. Um, so once you identify that those gaps occur, um, we had to identify the gaps and choosing locations where additional monitoring would be the most useful. Uh, and of course, then once you identify those gaps and you find a place to put them, like doing the logistics of like small sensor installs, like locating hosts, um, that first round in particular, there was a lot of moms and like aunts and uncles that volunteered to house a purple air at their house. Uh, Cause we literally did the first round overnight. Um, also uh, looking at safety and travel, like with our technicians, making sure it was safe for them to travel through those areas that might've been dangerous. Um, and picking after picking locations, making sure there was power and Wi-Fi and they were installed correctly and in the correct locations and where to house installation info, like photos of where people were installing things. One of the big questions that continues is who maintains and keeps an eye on these sensor, sensors functionality and who's looking at the data, who's keeping track of everything. Um, when you're using these sensors for emergency response, if you're like removing them from places and putting them into a different place, uh, changes in registration details when sensors are moved. Very important to keep track of all of that um, in your own records and also with Purple Air themselves. Uh, one of the big challenges we had during the events was communicating the difference between the Purple Air map and the AQ map. Um, I'll show you a little illustration here in a second. Um, when presenting that data and when the public is going looking for that data, and also how to communicate and interpret the data coming from multiple sources and keeping that messaging consistent. So this is just an example of the Purple Air map. If you were to go to purpleair.com and go to the map, and it comes up like that. And this is the AQ map, which is done in partnership with UNBC and ECCC. Um, the Purple Air uh, website, when you first open it up, it defaults to the US CPA AQI number and color scheme. Um, and the numbers are not actual concentrations and the color scheme is different than the color scheme we use in Canada. Uh, if you want to actually get 
um, concentration numbers, you need to go to that drop down box in the top left and scroll down and choose that. We just found that the, the public is not doing that when they're initially looking for information. Uh, whereas the AQ map shows uh, the data with a correction factor that was built for Canada. And you can also choose the raw data as well. And it shows the color scheme of the AQHI and also a one hour concentration number is inside those circles. And also if you hover over top of them, you can find different averages as well. And looking to the future, um, as I'm sure you all know, conversations are ongoing on how to move forward in utilizing purple airs and other small sensors to help augment air quality, air, air quality monitoring in Nova Scotia and across Canada, both for emergency response perspective and from a more permanent basis. I also just put together a slide that shows where you can find lots of information if you need it. And I'm glad I used the firework website because that's okay. <laughs> and that is everything for me. Thanks. Thank you so much. Your first question is from the Zoom. Is anyone looking at compounded harm or risk to workers already subject to indoor or outdoor particulate hazards and whether that can be incorporated into messaging? Here we go. Hello, Rashidi Hassi, um, head of a region engagement for the Water and Air Quality Bureau at Health Canada. So for messaging, that's me. And the quick answer is yes. <laughs> we are we are looking at that uh, for this coming season and then developing more uh, as we go along in the future. But yes, it's on the to-do list. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the room? Because then you could just hand them the mic. <laughs> oh. Anybody else out there? OK, there you go. <laughs> Uh, so for the uh, purple air sensors, uh, for the Tantalon fires, uh, who can I ask for the locations of those sensors when they measure the data? Who's the person to ask that to? Because I, I have a colleague that's been working on the data, and they don't have access to the like exact location of those. Hi there. Um, I could just talk with, oh, I guess for the folks on phone. Um, that data is publicly available. And the Latin long locations should be there. The caveat is one of the points that Stephanie made is the registration for the sensors is manual. So unfortunately, the Latin longs in the file, you hope they haven't moved, let's face it. You may see that in the data. For us, from the forecasting aspect, the way we've dealt with that is we have an auto QAQC algorithm that helps us to know if there's an outlier and if it has been moved because that is a common error in the data so you can feel free to reach out to me so we can talk after about that um and andrew seems to have a good idea here too i guess i'll jump in for lucy uh, the data is available on that aq map that you saw the link so you can download it from there and it will have the the spatial co coordinates and information on the website so probably the easiest way to get the data directly thank you very much do we have any more questions? Nope, everybody's ready to take a little break. Okay, we're gonna get started. Our next um, presentation is from Angelos Anastopoulos. He's a PhD, is a senior exposure scientist with expertise in source apportionment modeling, health burden analysis, and ambient exposures to particulate matter and its components, including PAHs. Dr. Anastopoulos led the Sector Health Impacts Assessment Project and is principal investigator for several source-focused exposure studies, emphasizing transportation sources such as marine, rail, and on-road and their effects on neighborhood air quality. Today, he's gonna to talk about air quality and the health impacts of transportation, industry, and the residential sector um, national trends and findings for the Atlantic region. So I'd like to um, introduce you to Dr. Angelos Anastopoulos. Okay, hello everybody. 
I'm going to just share my screen and then maybe get a confirmation that it is uh, working. So I'm going to share this one. Okay, good. So first of all, yes, I'm Angelos Anastasopoulos from Health Canada. Uh, and before I even kind of jump into the material, I wanted to just uh, mention some of the collaborators because science, of course, is very collaborative. So you can see some of the names I've listed here, uh, my colleagues at Health Canada, um, you heard from Carlin earlier as well. She sits on uh, the team, of course, that that heads up this kind of work, and I've been able to work with her. Um, and also a lot of Environment Canada folks. We also have Public Health Agency of Canada as well, uh, as well as some of the universities, including uh, not too far away, Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia has been a collaborator on some of the work that I'm going to briefly show. So um, with that, there's three sections that I wanted to talk about today. Now we're going to spend most of our time on the health burden analysis results by sector. I think this is uh, a really good contribution and it builds on what Carlin presented this morning and the others as well on, on um, wildfire smoke. We'll be able to talk about some other sectors that are very, very important as well and kind of put things all in context, one sector versus another this way. Uh, then we're going to briefly touch on, uh, or I'm going to tell a good news story, which is about the marine sector, marine transportation, shipping, and uh, therefore certainly very relevant to the Atlantic region, of course, as you know better than, than we do here in uh, National Capital Region. And then I wanted to just kind of quickly show you at the end where we're going next, uh, the ongoing work that is happening that it will be, I think, of interest to most of the folks in this room. So let's start with the sector health burden analysis. So this project, and you've already seen some similar stuff, so I can kind of skip some of the details on the modeling, which I'm happy to skip actually, just because of time. Um, but what was a little bit different about this particular health burden project is we wished to quantify health burdens by multiple sectors. So kind of similar to what Carlin presented this morning, where the goal there was to really focus and say, okay, what's the health burden of wildfire smoke exposure ambient? We wanted to do this for many, many sectors, uh, all within one modeling box, basically, be able to run uh, scenario after scenario. And that then allows us to have really nice estimates that we can compare apples to apples. And that was kind of the big picture of stepping away goal of this project. Now I've listed here the sectors that we uh, ran within this project. You can see there's a lot of them. So we have transportation sectors, we have uh, industry sectors, we have residential combustion sectors. We don't have everything, it's very comprehensive. We had 21 different sector or sector scenarios that we looked at. Uh, the ones that we didn't are listed here. Wildfires is one of them. Agriculture is another, those are big ones. Um, transboundary also might come to mind. However, we have done these, of course, as we saw Carlin's presentation this morning on wildfires. So we do have estimates for that particular uh, source. We also, uh, well, I don't wanna to give too much away on agriculture, we'll talk at the end. Uh, and we've also done work in our group on transboundary pollution and kind of separating that out and putting that as well in context. And happy to refer you um, after the, uh, the workshop to colleagues who do this work and papers that we've published on that. Now, I mentioned that I wouldn't get into the modeling too much and I won't, I'll simply say that it's similar to what you saw presented this morning by my colleague, Dr. Matz. So it's a three-step modeling process. In this case, not exactly the same, no firework involved here because we weren't looking at that sector, but a similar idea, basically being that you start with emissions inventory modeling uh, and spatially allocate those emissions across the country. You then use that as a set of inputs to the air quality model and the air quality model is Environment Canada's uh, GEMMAC operational model that we used. Uh, it was for the 2015 modeling year, I can say that. And then once the air quality modeling is done, the results are then fed into, after being population weighted, of course, uh, so that they can be fed into the health burden model, that's Health Canada's ACPAT, Air Quality Benefits Assessment Tool model that we ran. And that then gives us what we're gonna talk about today. It gives us health burdens by census division, that's the resolution of the model for each sector, um, and what that really means is that means mortality endpoints, morbidity endpoints that are associated with these three key pollutants that have high health relevance. Uh, PM 2.5, of course, fine particulate matter, NO2 and ozone. And so we're gonna look at some of these results. Okay, so let's start by just saying nationally, what did we find nationally when you compare these sectors? 
Well, we found that from the sectors that we modeled, this, this long list of transportation industry and residential combustion sectors, the ones with the greatest health burden, you can kind of see them on the right. This is a graph of premature mortality annual for the year that we modeled uh, for the sum of the pollutant um, that have fatal endpoints, PM2.5, NO2, ozone, and summer ozone, as I list here at the bottom. And you can kind of clearly see, we have kind of head and shoulders, home firewood burning coming out as the dominant sector, contributing the most premature mortality and of course, most morbidity as well. And it's followed by all on-road transportation, then followed by ore and mineral industry, and then so on. It kind of moves towards an asymptote as you move along through the sectors. Uh, so the key takeaway here is some very large numbers um, for a sector that we didn't really have a lot of information on before, which was home firewood burning or re residential wood combustion. And yet we know, uh, especially folks that are in communities where this is still common, whether this, there haven't been bylaws or more rural communities, or even if there are bylaws and there's still sources of home firewood burning occurring, uh, those folks know, I know in my neighborhood as well, that it can be a very big source, very palpable in terms of you can kind of notice the PM2.5 smell. You can actually measure it if you have a monitor like a purple air and you can kind of see that you have high days. So quantifying it, we see that indeed this is a significant sector depending on where you are in the country. Now, on that note, I think the results are more uh, relevant when you drill down a little bit. So national is interesting, but it's actually the scale where action can be taken um, that I think the results are more interesting. So here, let's look here at the top three sectors contributing health burden. In this case, it's the same metric here of air pollution related premature mortality. So the top three sectors across the country by province, and you can kind of see a couple takeaways here. So first of all, we can see that there's, uh, you'll see some colors showing up again and again and again. So these are sectors that are ranking high almost everywhere. Uh, and the sectors are residential wood combustion, that's the red that you can see here, here, and as well in the Atlantic provinces. And it's also on-road transportation. So that kind of mirrors what we saw with the overall national results. So, it, but it, now it has a little bit more relevance when it's at the provincial level where we're getting closer to the air quality management um, set of jurisdictions. Now, the other takeaway though, is kind of the flip side of that coin, right? And the flip side is that we have other sectors that are contributing a lot of health burden, but they seem to be more regional. And these tend generally to be industry sources. So for example, uh, in the West, maybe not a surprise at all, it's the oil and gas industry that's contributing uh, actually first ranked in Alberta and Saskatchewan, even more than on-road transportation in terms of premature deaths. Uh, and then as we move to central Canada, we have the ore and mineral industry, which is quite significant, coming up third. And again, getting to be similar order of magnitude as all on-road transportation. Um, then we have, that's also the case, I want to call out here in, in uh, the Atlantic province of New Brunswick. So basically where, where you folks are today, and I, I'm with you in spirit. I wish I could be there, but travel didn't work out. Um, and then we have coal-fired power generation as a significant source as well, coming up in the top three where we have, as expected, where we have still coal-fired power plants operating uh, in 2015. And in most of these cases, these power plants are continuing uh, to operate even today. And that includes the Atlantic provinces that you can kind of see here. Uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and PEI are affected by emissions from those sources. And the other one worth mentioning for the Atlantic provinces is marine transportation. So even with the good news story that I'm going to talk about later, we're still seeing that uh, air pollution from shipping comes up as a significant uh, source for health burden in Nova Scotia and in Newfoundland, for example, where there are large busy ports. Now, the other thing to mention here is, uh, as mentioned this morning, the Health Canada uh, ACBAT tool also puts um, a valuation, uh, not the same as healthcare costs, as Carlin explained correctly, uh, but a very useful metric as well, especially when it's, it comes to communicating to decision makers uh, within the Canadian context. And so you can see even in some of the smaller provinces, in New Brunswick, for example, the, uh, the, value, the healthcare valuation, sorry, the health valuation of these health burdens is 260 million annually. So a significant number and, uh, and just something to kind of keep uh, in the back of your, in the back pocket as well, in addition to the mortality and the morbidity. Now let's 
go even kind of closer scale, like finer scale, getting a little bit, not local certainly, but we'll talk about that later. So the air zone scale, this is the first time doing this health burden modeling that our group at least uh, aggregated the health burden results at the air zone scale. We did this very intentionally right when we designed the project. We said that we're going to report at the air zone scale. And that's because the air zone scale is where we have air zone managers in Canada, which under the air quality management system, AQMS, um, and there's more information on a lot of this here at the CCMA website. It's an excellent website as a resource. So under the AQMS system in Canada, where air quality is managed towards continually improving, that's the scale at which we have folks uh, and jurisdiction to improve air quality and therefore reduce health burdens due to air quality exposures. And so that is why we, we kind of broke out at the air zone scale right across the country and we report these and they're available to share as well. So I have pulled out um, one air zone, the air zone that's relevant here today where the workshop is, which is central New Brunswick air zone. It's a very large area. Uh, it includes uh, the, the majority of the population or a large population at least. And the numbers within this air zone, so large area, but still pretty small compared to uh, these typically um, figures that you typically hear for health burdens, which is national le level in most cases and perhaps provincial. So even at this now more finer scale, we're seeing that there are 21 premature deaths annually, uh, morbidity, of course, that goes with that and scales with that. And I wanna just take one moment here to mention like the endpoints for morbidity, this is significant. We often kind of focus on the premature death, of course, and correctly, but we have here also bronchitis cases, both adult and, and children's bronchitis cases that are a concern that occur because of exposures, of course. Um, we have asthma symptom days, we have hospital admission and emergency room visits for cardiac and respiratory symptoms, and we have additional health endpoints, and I'll point you at the end to where you can find more information and even get these tabulations for these numbers. And, and again, as I mentioned, the economic valuation corresponding to this health burden uh, just within this air zone of central New Brunswick is 240 million annually. That's summing across the mortality and the morbidity endpoints. Uh, now, which pollutants are driving these health impacts? Well, it's largely PM 2.5. It's followed then by ozone. That's in this particular air zone. That might change as you move around the country to other air zones. Uh, but that's the case in this location. And that's why this information is going to be of interest to air zone managers. Now, which sectors then? This is kind of the main question that we wanted to get at with this, with this work. Well, it's similar to what we saw in terms of number one, it was residential wood combustion. That was a total of nine deaths driven mostly by PM 2.5, which makes sense for this source. Following that is the ore and mineral industry, then on-road transportation. And then we have three, I kind of went a little further here because I think you know it, it's important to kind of get the overall context. We have several sources that they have similar health burden. Uh, and so it's kind of a bit of a false dichotomy to say, oh, these are the ones that matter. It's these, these three. You have marine transportation, you have manufacturing, and you have coal-fired electric power generation. All of those are contributing, uh, in this case, to premature deaths annually within this central um, central air zone in New Brunswick. So uh, important to kind of have kind of the answer to what perhaps should be a focus for uh, mitigation actions or other management actions. So now let's kind of step back and say, okay, what were our key findings? There's so many more findings that I can share, and I'll point you in a second to the best way to maybe to do that. But one key finding is simply that the geographic scale is very important. So when you're saying what is the what are the main sectors that I should worry about and therefore try to improve to improve air quality and therefore reduce air quality uh, health risk, well, that might be a different set of answers if you're talking about nationally versus provincially and territorially versus at the air zone and even beyond the air zone to find a resolution getting close to municipal. And at that point, we understand it as a local uh, scale. So that's important to take away. Another one is that because we have we have targeted this scale of air zones very intentionally, as I mentioned, this data we feel is, uh, is going to be of relevance to air quality management system and the managers. And we have in fact, through this process of doing this project been uh, sharing results with them, and that will only accelerate going forward. And then the other takeaway, very important, I think, 
um, is that you can't just single out one class of sectors. You can't say, wow, we did all this work and we found it's mostly transportation. Uh, it is transportation. There's significant health burdens due to transportation, uh, air pollution, but it's also industry sources. It is also very much, as we saw, residential combustion sources. Now, the other thing, I kind of hinted at this, I want to let everybody know that we published a report on this. It's pretty recent. It was just last year, around this time, 23 is when it came out. We will make the link uh, available in the chat after this as well, um, so that you can download a copy of the report. There are appendices in the report with detailed data by sector, all the health burdens and so on. And there's also supplementary information that you can just contact us and we're happy to share that as well. So with that, let's now switch gears and tell this good news story. It's a short one, but I think it's a good one uh, on marine transportation sector fuel quality, uh, quality and regulation of it. So this, uh, this set of this body of work basically was a couple of things. We had some field work that occurred. We had analysis of, of uh, historical NAPS data, which is what I'm gonna present here today. But what we were trying to get at was, was this regulation on marine sector fuel quality in Canadian waters effective? And just a very quick backstory. And again, being out in the Atlantic, I think you, guys, you folks are more aware of this than uh, other parts of Canada perhaps, but historically large vessels, large ships coming into port or sailing anywhere essentially have used uh, a fuel called bunker fuel oil or otherwise called heavy fuel oil which is undistilled fuel from the bottom of the distillation column therefore very high in sulfur and what that means of course is very high so2 emissions or SOx emissions at least and very high as a result of that pm 2.5 as well as forming secondary pm 2.5 high NOx as well definitely worth mentioning but certainly these emissions attributed um, to a big extent simply to the type of fuel that these vessels have traditionally used. And so this regulation, which was done with the United States as well as with Mexico, so North American wide, was to set an emission control area whereby when ships came within this emission control area, 270 kilometers or so of the Canadian coast or the respective country's coasts, they would have to switch fuel to a lower sulfur fuel or use an equivalent emissions control device like stack after treatment basically. And so we knew this happened. The regulation took place in full effect uh, in 2015. And so we wanted to, to have a look back and see if we saw an improvement in air quality at the ports. So we looked at multiple port cities. We applied statistical trend analysis right across the country at Pacific Atlantic and Great Lakes and St. Lawrence uh, Seaway cities. And we also applied source apportionment modeling at the two coasts, Halifax on the, on the east and Vancouver Burnaby on the west with the goal of quantifying even the effect on PM 2.5. So a lot of detail, a lot more detail you can read in the papers that with uh, my co-authors, we put out one in 2021 and one just last year, but the key findings, first of all, I said it's good news. It is. The regulation was effective. It improved air quality. Specifically, it improved it for SO2. Makes sense because generally the ships switched to a distillate fuel that was low sulfur. And it also improved it for PM2.5 2, 2 components. Uh, the heavy metals, vanadium, nickel, sulfate was reduced, which makes sense because you had less sulfur, therefore less to form sulfate. Uh, and therefore PM went down as well. So for SO2, if we just dwell on that for one second, what, what it really means, levels went down, what does that really mean, Angelos? Okay, well, it means that now in these port cities, since the regulation took effect in 2015, we're typically seeing uh, SO2 PPB levels that are more comparable to non-port cities, whereas prior, certainly, if you compared uh, Halifax, for example, um, or Vancouver on the West Coast, and then you compare it to a city even nearby, that was further from, further from the port, unless there happened to be a smelter or some other industrial source nearby, you would, you would see that the port city had much, much higher SO2 levels. And so that right off the bat is a very positive thing for air quality and health because SO2, as we know, it has acute health risk associated with it. Uh, specifically, asthma symptom onset is one, uh, is one endpoint that is tied to SO2 exposures. And so that was a very positive story for uh, Canadians in the port cities. And for PM 2.5, a very big deal, the decrease there from what we estimate was about one microgram per meter cubed. 
Um, even if not all of that is attributed to the regulation, a good chunk of it was. And that's a really big deal. It seems like a small number, but if you consider that Canadian um, air quality levels of PM2.5 generally are low, especially on the Atlantic coast where you folks are, they tend to be low. So this decrease is significant. And really the other way to think of it is that, as we all know, fine PM is a non-threshold pollutant. There is no safe level. So seeing a, a decrease in this is absolutely the right direction for things to be going. So uh, we'll leave that story there. And the last thing on what's coming up, what are we working on now and what's coming next? And I'll be happy to, to return and kind of give some updates. Well, first of all, on the health burden analysis work, um, we're, we've done updated modeling and literally it's happening kind of as I speak to you in a sense is, is now looking at the results. So we ran the model again with 2019. That's, we just received updated 2019 available data from Environment Canada just a few months ago. So we have run this now and we've included not only all the sectors that I've talked about earlier in this presentation today, but we also included agriculture. And that's a really big deal for us, just like Looking at residential wood combustion was a very, very big deal. We've now also included another big one that we just didn't have a good handle on what this contribution to health burden might be. So we've looked at agriculture uh, as a whole, as well as animal agriculture, crop agriculture. So we now have those model outputs, including the health burdens that correspond to the air quality impacts. And we'll be putting that together and sharing it forward. Um, the other thing to mention is that the residential wood combustion estimates have now been improved. The uh, inventory that Environment Canada has available improved over the prior one. And so we look forward to sharing that update and showing if there's any difference from the results I've showed you today. Uh, we're putting together a journal paper, which will come out late this year and happy to kind of forward um, that information to NB Lung and all the stakeholders when that's available. And the other thing that I'm really excited about, and all of us working on this, uh, my colleagues in Ottawa and elsewhere, uh, we're putting together an interactive website. And I want to say this is a collaboration with uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. They've got a lot of expertise in sharing data and making it interactive and meaningful. And so we are working with them to put together a brand new website. It's going to present health burden results by sector, similar to what I showed you, uh, but we're going to have it so that you can query it, a user, either an expert user or just a Canadian that has an interest or perhaps an NGO. They'll be able to search for a specific sector, for a specific pollutant, and then the health endpoint that is uh, associated with that particular pollutant. They'll be able to aggregate the results at different scales. So, of course, the ones that I have shared with everybody here today, but we actually plan to go even more smaller scale. Um, the model results, as I kind of hinted at, are actually at the census division scale, so quite a bit finer. So whether we report right at the census division scale or at the very least allow the user to piece together the census divisions that, that correspond to a municipal boundary, which we know we've worked with some city partners, uh, city stakeholders, I should say, that have asked us for that type of information as they look to manage their own air quality locally. So that is something we're very, very excited and that uh, stay tuned for that. Um, we expect to have something to go live in about a year. I want to say kind of around this time, a year from now. Um, so yes, yeah, stay tuned. And we're happy to kind of share the updates on that as we go forward. And with that, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have um, any questions? We could do a couple of quick questions before we go on. Yeah, hi. Uh, when you were... Uh giving the numbers about the marine sector and shipping as it applies to Halifax Dartmouth Port. Uh, did you take into account at the same time one of the reasons the numbers were so improved was the fact that the imperial oil, oil in a refinery closed at roughly the same time? Yes, excellent. Excellent question. Uh, and thanks for bringing that up. That's kind of the local knowledge that, that really matters. Yes, we did take that into account. And, um, and uh, it, of course, taking it into account means right off the bat, you have potentially confounding because you had this other positive thing happening at the same time. That said, um, if you look uh, in either of the papers that I mentioned, I'm happy to kind of forward them even, even through um, the chat function here as well. Uh, we were able to see clearly where you have a difference in 
um, source characteristics between the refinery, which is kind of enriched in some different metal species that are not uh, enriched in typically in ship exhaust, burning heavy fuel oil. So we saw, first of all, a, a signature difference, if I can call it that, in the chemical profile that the model kind of separated out. Um, and the timing was also kind of relevant as well, because there wasn't an exact match on the timing of when those things happened. So when we look at, at holistically at what sources turned on, turned off, what happened over this period, we modeled from 2010 to 2016. And we did that so we would have approximately two years before the regulation, two years during the regulation as it was phased in, and then two years following. And so I think you'll find in that paper that uh, it's pretty clear that we can attribute most of that improvement to the regulation, but that refinery, I certainly agree with you, was a significant source. And it was a good thing that that also closed down. And it was the combo of, of the two that in Halifax specifically improved things. In some of the other cities, no, it was the, uh, there's there are typically refineries around. It, usually if there's, if there's water in a port, there's gonna be a refinery often. Uh, but in the other Canadian cities that are port cities, they didn't have that same, let's call it confounding, good news confounding. So there we were able to quantify and say, no, it was it was really only the regulation that occurred here that is the primary driver of these improvements. That said, we have more work to do. I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. But the the industry has has complied initially, as we saw. Um, but we also have have heard from working closely with Environment Canada and Transport Canada that the way in which ships are complying is changing a little bit um, going forward. Initially, it was by switching to distillate fuel oil because that's kind of what they had time to do. And that's our best case in terms of improving health. Uh, but we're also seeing the, the regulation does allow after treatment like scrubbers. And that has a different potential set of pollutants that could come out. Uh, including more black carbon and so on. And so we're following that story. So it's, I can still say it's very much a good news story, but it is not done because the industry then does some switches to save costs. And therefore our job continues uh, as scientists to study the story and then to work with the regulators to, uh, to see that air quality continues to improve going forward in all the port cities. Great. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Excellent question. There's so much more behind that. I'd be very happy to chat further. I have um, one from Zoom and then one more here. What factors are considered or what caveats are there when looking at the municipality level? Oh, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure quite how to interpret that, but I will. Was that a question from the room there? So. I will say that we have our results from the model at the finer resolution of census division. And so what we can do is we can we can aggregate, just as we've aggregated, for example, to the Arizona results that I showed, we can aggregate those to municipal boundary. And we've done some ad hoc reporting to um, City of Vancouver has asked us for some of these results. And we also have had requests uh, a couple of years ago now from um, Toronto, City of Toronto, general Toronto area, and they kind of wanted to have a handle on things. So we worked with them on an ad hoc basis and said, okay, we'll share with you our results. In terms of, of factors, the only other thing I might mention is we remind users of the data, and we'll have to make this clear in the website as well, that because you have um, a source within an area, you could literally be staring at, at a factory, for example, um, you can't immediately jump to the conclusion that that's the reason why we're seeing the high levels or the high burdens in our case. What we're really interested here is what is the premature mortality? What are the, the premature morbidities or the morbidities associated? Um, you have to have, of course, the transport from the source to the receptor. And so sometimes, and that's what makes the modeling the best way to do this, because uh, sometimes we have locations within the country that are affected by sources that are outside of their boundaries. And so that is a very interesting thing to learn. And that's why we found municipalities have been interested because in some cases they're like, tell us how the ranking is because some of these things we can tackle. We can, we can do bylaws for transportation management and we can you know reconsider where some roads go and we can do bylaws for wood burning. In other cases, there are things that are neighboring 
jurisdictions. And then that also then prompts a set of discussions with the neighboring jurisdiction and kind of collaboratively working to improve things. Um, but all of this is really starts from having the results at a scale that is relevant to decision makers. So we're we're pretty excited about the website we're putting we're putting together. Thank you. Excellent question. Hi, Angelos. I have a quick question. Um, I read this report numerous times. Uh, it's full of lots of information. I'm really excited about the next iteration that includes agriculture. And I'm just wondering if you have any uh, preliminary results you'd be comfortable uh, yeah. sharing with the crowd today. Thank you. I don't want to share too much detail, but I because we intend to publish on it. It's only because you know, you know the rule, right? It's like if you if you give too much information and then you try to publish and you've kind of already given the information, but at the same time, among friends, let's just put it this way, among friends, uh, the agriculture sector can be substantial in terms of its contribution, uh, its impact on air quality and therefore its contribution. Of course, it's everything that I, it's all the caveats that I mentioned today. It, it can show up when I say substantial, just so I don't like be too vague here. It can show up within the top, three, four, five in some location. So it is a big deal in terms of impacting health burden, uh, but it's also very, very regional. And this is where it gets interesting because in some cases you have agriculture that is near enough to populations, as I think Carlin mentioned and Stephanie as well earlier, um, you really have to have, you can have really high air quality and that's you know not good from one perspective, but it won't affect your health burden tally because you just don't have population exposed to it there. So the agriculture is an interesting one. The regional aspect of it is is interesting. We're excited to kind of share that as we as we kind of are ready to, uh, because it really does depend on where it's occurring, what the proximity is to population centers. Um, but but certainly, you know, one one kind of takeaway we can we can all kind of share comfortably here is that it is an important sector. We're glad to have modeled it, uh, and we're thankful to our colleagues at uh, AAFC Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. It's not a common common department name to say, but yes, we're very thankful that they prepared the inventory to the level of quality that they did. That we're going to have some real confidence in what we're sharing for this first set of agriculture data. But thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. This goes really well after um, Dr. Anastopoulos is a, since we're talking about um, air quality and transportation, Thomas Arneson McNeil is a senior energy coordinator based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He is passionate about electric vehicle policy, new mobility strategies, and providing clean, affordable, and reliable energy solutions for Nova Scotians and their families. He is the lead on the electric school bus project and his most recent work at the EAC involved advocacy and engagement on Canada's electric vehicle availability standard. Prior to joining the EAC, Thomas worked as the energy and climate advisors as an intern. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from Dalhousie University and a Master of Arts in Sustainable Energy Policy from Carleton University. And just before I let him go on, I'm going to tell you, and we know Halifax has electric buses now for the transit. We did try to get one here today, like to maybe go for a ride or get to see, but they're still working on their training. So next year, maybe, unless we hold it in New Brunswick then, you know, maybe we'll have some electric buses there too. Anyways, with that, I would like to introduce, um, he's going to speak about electric school buses and the impact on children's health. This is Thomas Arneson McNeil. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so so thanks very much for having me. Uh, my name's Thomas Arneson McNeil. I'm a senior energy coordinator uh, with the Ecology Action Center. Uh, in Halifax, I am sorry that I, I can't be there uh, today, um, but very excited to uh, speak to you all um, and, and particularly to engage, uh, you know, health experts and, and advocates on, on some of the advocacy work uh, that we're doing. Um, you know, as it was mentioned, uh, my previous work uh, includes advocacy on the, the federal electric vehicle availability standard. Um, and also uh, on a equivalent uh, provincial regulation. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we work closely with health advocates like, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the Canadian uh, Lung Association uh, and others in, in really trying to bring the health benefits of vehicle electrification 
uh, to the fore. So it's it's a really essential part of uh, policy advocacy. Uh, and you know, just to kind of preface my presentation, uh, I am not a health expert. Uh, you know, I, I am. You know, uh, I don't think I'm. I'm going to really be telling anyone anything that they don't know. I, I'm not here to present uh, primary research. Um, and so, you know, throughout my presentation, if if you're listening and sort of thinking, well, this guy could use some pointers, uh, you know, in terms of speaking to the health benefits of school bus electrification, uh, you know, you might not be wrong. Um, and uh, if that's the case, I would I would encourage you to get in touch. I mean, we're we're really interested in engaging health experts on this issue. Uh, they are trusted actors when it comes to uh, climate advocacy. Um, you know, writ large. Uh, and just thinking about the last presentation that we had, I mean, you know, this is off topic, but uh, uh, bunker C heavy fuel oil uh, for marine shipping was mentioned. I mean, you know, this is something that the government of Nova Scotia and Nova Scotia Power have indicated, uh, you know, we intend to burn on the grid uh, and we intend to retrofit coal plants in order to burn, uh, you know, bunker C heavy fuel oil for, for peaking purposes. And so, you know, that, that's another great example of I think that we really need an understanding of of what the health implications are of doing that. Uh, and we need health advocates to sort of come forward and 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 talk about uh, some of these implications. Certainly, electric school bus uh, advocacy is is one area uh, where that's a possibility. So uh, you know, just to go over uh, the parameters of the presentation, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on on school buses writ large in Atlantic Canada, uh, some past advocacy efforts. I'm gonna speak a little bit about health impacts of diesel school buses, but again, I mean, you know, you folks, I would say, uh, are, are better versed than me um, and better positioned to, to talk about this than, than I am. Um, and that's a big reason for us being here. Um, and and frankly, on you know we do a lot of work at the Ecology Action Center on on all different issues, um, and so you know whether you're looking to connect on on wilderness or marine or transportation, uh, energy issues. I mean, you know, do reach out to us. We're interested in connecting, um, and we're interested in in really the health advocacy uh, angle as it relates to climate policy. Um, so I'm going to talk about school bus electrification in Atlantic Canada. Uh, you know, some of the benefits um, and then, you know, policy solutions. And, and again, ending with that sort of call to action, which I think is a, a big part of, uh, you know, uh, why we're here and, and why we, you know, really like to um, impress upon you folks the, the importance of uh, this effort that we're undertaking. Um, you know, so just to give a bit of background on, on school bus electrification, uh, we've been advocating uh, on this issue for uh, about two years now. Uh, that advocacy will continue, um, you know, for, for years to come. We're, we're you know, funded to uh, work on this endeavor. Um, really, you know, when you're talking about uh, school buses in Atlantic Canada, uh, this is something that is, you know, fairly uh, centralized in terms of um, procurement. Uh, I'll get into that, but, you know, just writ large, we have about 1,300 school buses in Nova Scotia, um, a comparable number uh, in New Brunswick as well, uh, and then, you know, smaller amount in Prince Edward Island and about 900 in, in Newfoundland. Worth noting with Nova Scotia, uh, about, uh, you know, two-thirds of our school bus fleet is owned and operated by the province of Nova Scotia. It's procured by the province of Nova Scotia through uh, the EECD, the Education Department, um, but about one-third are private uh, school bus um, service providers, essentially. Uh, so this is something that's more common in Ontario, but you have, uh, you know, about four private companies that, uh, you know, mainly operate in the Halifax uh, Regional Center for Education, um, but also in the, the Conseil Scolaire Acadien Provincial, the, the Acadian School Board, um, and in the South Shore Regional Center for Education. So this is also kind of a, a piece of the, the problem here. Um, and so, you know, uh, as we're talking about the way that uh, school buses are you know, procured um, and operated in Atlantic Canada, we are kind of unique um, in, in this part of the world. Um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, briefly the the number of kilometers traveled, uh, the the number of CO two emissions, and, and and you know they're they're significant when you're looking at uh, Atlantic Canada as a region. Um, but you know, I, I think an interesting part of this is really the fact that uh, this is a fairly centralized process in Atlantic Canada. Essentially, all the provinces get together. Um, you know, as part of a group called the Atlantic, uh, the Council of Atlantic uh, Ministers of Education and Training, uh, CAMET, 
um, which is right now comprised of Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland. And essentially, you know, they, they replace, uh, you know, it kind of depends for Nova Scotia. It's about 100 buses, likewise for New Brunswick. Um, you know, it's it's less for Newfoundland, about 50. But, uh, you know, essentially, they they get together to procure these school buses um, to replace the the diesel school buses that are, are, you know, going off the roads after about uh, 14 years. Um, but, you know, this is the responsibility of uh, the provincial government. It, it's really, you know, government decisions and potentially procurement mandates can, can go a long way here in terms of kind of, uh, uh, you know, shifting um, the kind of buses uh, that we are buying, essentially. But it's it's not a question, as it is in other provinces, of, you know, convincing uh, many different private companies to individually electrify. Um, you know, these are <laughs> decisions that go through about one person <laughs> uh, at the education department uh, in Nova Scotia's case. Um, and so, you know, that's something worth uh, keeping in mind is, is the ability to convince uh, really, you know, provincial um, decision makers to act on this is, is everything. Uh, you know, so we we talk a lot about uh, in the sort of environmental advocacy world, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the CO2 um, emissions associated with uh, running diesel school buses um, in Atlantic Canada. Uh, we don't talk a lot about uh, the health impacts. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not just publicly, uh, internally, uh, education departments are not really, you know, quantifying um, really that the health impacts of uh, diesel school buses, that's that's not something that's taken into account um, when you're looking at, you know, procurement or, or decisions made around procurement. So one example is, you know, the internal New Brunswick 2019 school bus um, emissions comparison. Uh, this was a study that they did um, basically looking at the operations of two electric school buses that they were running um, in New Brunswick uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, that came out of the education department there. Uh, there were a number of recommendations that came out of that report, but they didn't look at health impacts. That's something that I want to stress. It's it's not something that is often uh, quantified by provinces. And so where we are saying, yeah, there's emissions impacts associated, um, you know, and this is one piece of on-road transportation. Uh, frequently, decision makers aren't looking at what is the impact on, on children's health, um, you know, in, in particular, uh, where you have, you know, tail um, pipes from diesel school buses kind of at, at you know, head level um, of, of school age children. Um, and, you know, that's, I, I think, really a, it's a missed opportunity not to talk about uh, these impacts. Uh, it's a real shame that they are not taken into account when, when we talk about uh, procurement. And, and I mean, I think that broadly, uh, we're starting to understand that parents in Canada, uh, you know, do care about the impact of uh, the health impact of school buses on children. Uh, very recent polling by the Canadian Lung Association, this is released in October uh, of last year, um, indicated that it's about, uh, it's about 78 or 73%, sorry, my uh, 78% excuse me, uh, of Canadians are concerned about uh, the health impacts of, uh, of school bus emissions on children. Uh, so even if decision makers aren't really taking this into account, uh, you know, parents certainly are. There's, you know, a, a sur super majority in terms of, uh, you know, parents are that are concerned about this. Uh, you know, this has been for decades, I think, really a, a, an area of advocacy. Um, you know, the, the EAC for a number of years, we've done walking school bus, uh, guides and, and programs. We've been doing those, <laughs> uh, for, for many years, uh, the idle free for kids campaign might be something that some folks are, are, uh, familiar with, um, you know, even in kind of the early two thousands, um, these advocacy efforts were, uh, underway. Um, and, and, you know, recently as part of our advocacy efforts, we've really been trying to mobilize and, and organize, um, you know, parents, um, but also where possible, uh, students and teachers to really, you know, start talking about, um, you know, the impacts of uh, diesel school buses in particular. And I think that the, the value of that is not just in terms of saying, well, there are health benefits to transitioning to electric school buses, um, you know, but also demonstrating to, you know, school age kids that it is possible in their daily lives to kind of see policy change um, in terms of uh, of climate policy. 
Um, and so school bus electrification, I think, is a is a great opportunity to kind of to showcase the fact that these changes can be made. Uh, again, I don't think I'm really telling folks stuff that they don't know, and I'm not presenting new research. Um, but just broadly, I mean, the impacts uh, um, of diesel emissions, I mean, you know, PM 2.5, there are various health impacts associated um, with that, including heart attacks, asthma attacks, uh, chronic bronchitis. Um, you know, th these many of these health issues are, are something that, you know, affect children acutely because they do have, uh, you know, quicker uh, breathing rates. Uh, as well, but you know the impact of, of ground level ozone, uh, as well of, of nitrogen um, dioxide. Uh, there are very serious uh, health impacts associated with these chemical compounds that are, are present, um, you know, within uh, diesel emissions. Um, and ultimately, I, I think it's you know trying to center the fact that uh, you know diesel writ large, I mean, you know, has been classified as a, a carcinogen. Um, by many different organizations, it is, you know, the basis of when you look at uh, vehicle emissions regulation in places like California, I mean, it's all done by the California Air Resources Board. So everything to do with electrification in that region of the world is, is motivated by reducing the health impacts of, of chemical compounds like, uh, uh, like these. Um, and so it can be, a, you know, a primary kind of policy driver. Um, when we talk about trying to encourage uh, the transition away from uh, diesel, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, schools and, and children. Uh, you know, to go into to a bit more detail, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Health Canada study from 2021, um, you know, estimating uh, the impact of, of pollutants like PM2.5, um, nitrous oxide and, and ground level ozone, I think is, is really a study that we try and cite uh, you know, frequently in terms of our public communications um, and our communications with uh, government. Um, you know, I, again, <laughs> like, I, I think that, you know, uh, part of the reason we're here is to really kind of solicit um, input and to make connections with uh, actors um, uh, in, you know, who are experts in health advocacy in, in terms of kind of uh, really centering uh, these concerns. And, and, you know, you folks likely can say it better than I can um, in terms of the importance of, of really uh, mitigating some of these um, impacts. But, you know, of course, the ones that we try and cite most often are, are kind of tiredness and irritability, uh, headaches and nausea associated with, um, you know, exposure to some of these uh, chemical compounds. Um, you know, and, and we've heard just anecdotally um, when we talk to like uh, folks at the uh, at the school board in in PEI um, and bus drivers in in Prince Edward Island, where they do have um, school electric school buses, um, you know, we hear that there is kind of a anecdotally uh, some change in in behavior associated with a quiet school bus um, where you don't have you know uh, emissions like within the cabin in, in the same way. Uh, Again, I mean, like the fact that I think parents are are aware of some of these impacts um, informs the fact that like a vast majority of parents in in Canada uh, support a transition towards electric school buses. Eighty three uh, percent. Um, it really is kind of uh, staggering, but I, I think that the more that we can kind of um, basically talk about what parents already know that there are health impacts associated with diesel school buses, you, you know, the more we can create the kind of political will that is, is needed. Um, school bus electrification in Atlanta, Canada, PEI is the leader here. Now uh, they got 88 electric school buses on the road. It's about 25% of their fleet. Uh, and they're looking to transition the whole fleet uh, by 2032. Uh, New Brunswick as well, you know, making progress. Um, they're getting about 20 electric school buses. Those are kind of being um, uh, rolled out uh, last year and this year. So that will bring their total up to about uh, 22. Uh, so they're, they're moving ahead as well. In Nova Scotia, uh, we're currently undertaking a feasibility study uh, through the Council of Atlantic Ministers of Education and Training that's being led by the Education Department in Nova Scotia. We're expecting the publication um, of that study uh, by the end of next month. So this is going to be kind of a key uh, advocacy moment. Uh, certainly from our perspective, um, you know, we're going to get this feasibility study 
Um, and, and, you know, essentially, I think what it will say is, is we should be following the footsteps of these provinces that are, um, you know, much farther ahead. We don't want to start with the longest school bus routes in the province, I'm guessing, um, but likely starting with shorter, um, you know, urban routes and then following some of the learnings and best practices from those uh, other provinces that have, have already moved ahead. Um, you know, health benefits, I mean, no tailpipe emissions is a big one. Uh, some uh, electric school buses do have, uh, you know, what tend to be Wobasto, uh two liter uh, diesel heaters in the cabin in order to reduce, um, you know, the, the uh, any impacts on, on range associated with cold weather. It varies in terms of uh, manufacturer. So, for example, the line electric buses that they have uh, in PEI uh, have diesel heaters in the cabin, uh, others produced by Thomas. Um, uh, bus manufacturing uh, do not have diesel heaters, but rather rely entirely on electric heat. And then, you know, uh, Navistar International buses, you can kind of, they have diesel heaters, but you can sort of switch them on and off. Um, so that's a, that's a concern for sure. Um, you know, other, I think, impacts that we've heard about, uh, hearing loss is quite common uh, with school bus drivers as a result of the noise associated with the diesel engine. Um, anecdotally, uh, in PEI, you know, we've really heard about um, the fact that these buses are a lot quieter, um, and, and so reducing that impact. Uh, and some provinces that are, have been farther ahead of, have looked to quantify the benefits of school bus electrification um, from a health perspective. And so Quebec has estimated that when they electrify their school bus fleet, um, as they're projected to do uh, by 2035, uh, that they will save, uh, you know, about $1 million in, in uh, healthcare uh, savings uh, per year. Uh, and so certainly it's possible to kind of quantify some of the benefits associated with uh, school bus electrification and, and use that as an argument to move ahead. Um, you know, federal and provincial funding here, I think, is, is essential. Uh, the federal government right now will cover 50% of the cost of the bus and charging infrastructure. Uh, we really need provinces to start setting targets like PEI has to say, okay, we're going to look to electrify every school bus in Nova Scotia by, by 2035, for example. Um, but really setting that top-down target is, I think, what gets things moving. Certainly it has in, in PEI. Um, and, and we need boldness on the part of the decision makers. Um, and, and, you know, we're also looking right now, we're in conversations with, um, you know, CSAP, with the HRCE, at trying to get these private companies to uh, deploy electric school buses in a pilot project um, capacity. And so we're hopeful there. But again, we could, you know, use some help from healthcare advocates. So uh, do get in touch. Uh, my email is at the end of the slides here. Um, and, and certainly uh, NB Long has my contact information, but if you're interested in kind of connecting on this issue uh, and potentially, you know, speaking to this issue, um, both in a, you know, um, community organizing capacity and in, in, a, in a media context, then we'd really love to hear from you and, and to help to push this issue along. Um, and so I'll say uh, thank you very much. Uh, look forward to hearing you and, and looking forward to, to getting our, our first electric school bus on the road, hopefully soon in Nova Scotia. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions for Thomas? I don't see any hands here. Anything on Zoom, Dusty? Okay. So since we don't have any questions, Thomas, thank you very much. We will pop your thank you into the mail to you, and thanks for being here with us today. Appreciate it. So next, I'm just going to stand here since I have the mic. Uh, we have Rohini Paris, and she's going to kind of, we've listened to a lot of the negative and the scary stuff about air quality indoor and outdoor, and she's going to give us some hope here. <laughs> so, Rohani Paris is the president and CEO of the Environmental Health Associations of Quebec and Canada. For close to 30 years, she's volunteered, managed, and grown the group to around 2,000 members. She's built bridges with similar groups in Canada and around the world, including doctors, scientists, universities, and government, to raise awareness about the disability of multiple chemical sensitivities and she advocates for help and support in this population. She's presented many workshops across Canada and has developed programs, websites, workshops, and webinars on all aspects, including workplace accommodations for MCS. In 2011, she collaborated with the University of Quebec in Montreal and Taluk to develop an education and awareness program funded by the Ministry of Education Quebec. She's going to talk about creating inclusive, accessible places, solutions, preventions, so, uh, welcome, Rohini Paris. Thank you. 
Okay, perfect. So hello everyone and thank you for having us here today. The title of my presentation is Certain Product Choices Can Trigger Disability, Need to Understand, and Need to Act. Uh, on behalf of the Environmental Health Association of Quebec, I acknowledge the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people whose traditional and unceded territory we are upon today. We honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory, and we stand committed to respecting and amplifying the voice, values, and cultural heritage of our hosts. The Environmental Health Association of Quebec and Canada are dedicated to helping people who experience the disability of multiple chemical sensitivity, MCS. We recognize the suffering caused by this disability and provide concrete solutions for better management of this health condition and for accessibility to everyday living. We work on an affordable, ecological, and healthy housing project for people experiencing MCS, and we provide resources and education support for people with MCS to and also collaborate with other groups and carry out research. In November 2022, we launched the Empowering Community and Removal of Barriers Project, or the ECRA project, which is funded in part by the Government of Canada's Social Development Partnerships Program Disability Component. This project supports promoting education and awareness for justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility for the disability of multiple chemical sensitivity, other health conditions, and other disabilities. Our partners in this project are from across Canada and represent different disciplines, including legal, medical, disability, environmental, private business, and indigenous participation. We are proud to say that NB Lung is one of our very important partners in this project. Throughout this project, we have also reached out to the MCS community across Canada, and in the spirit of nothing without us, we held many interactive workshops with our community, including focus groups. In the following slide, I will read a quotation from one of the participants. This quotation reflects the stories we heard from across Canada. But before I read this quotation out to you, I need to clarify the term accommodation and what that term means to someone with a disability. For people in wheelchairs, accommodation is a ramp that is built to the appropriate specifications. For people with multiple chemical sensitivity or MCS, accommodation means the use of products free of scents, colognes, perfumes, incense, essential oils, or fragrances and these pro pro uh, products should be known to least toxic and without masking agents that are used in the product. Also, off-gassing is the process of chemicals or VOCs, volatile organic compounds, emanating from products. And this is the quotation from one of our group participants. Where I live right now, I'm very ill. I get almost daily exposures to laundry and off-gassing coming into my unit. And basically, when I've asked for accommodation, all I've gotten is abuse and harassment and more discrimination. I've tried to take, you know, my human rights on an individual basis, one at a time, but it's exhausting, especially for people like me who are already ill. And I find that when I try to do that, I encounter barrier after barrier, systems that are in place, systems that are in place to help people like me, oftentimes end up letting us down. This quote captures the harsh reality faced by many individuals living with MCS. Accessing public spaces has become a constant battle against exposure to triggers affecting nearly every aspect of their life. Many cannot work, they struggle to complete basic tasks of daily living and can find relief even in their own homes due to exposures. This forces many to withdraw from society, forced to manage their disability in, in isolation. However, this isolation comes at a cost, often leading to social disconnection and economic hardship. Seeking support from others often leads to disbelief, skepticism, or even hostility, compounding their already immense challenges. Multiple chemical sensitivity is a chronic condition that is initiated or started following exposure to substances commonly used in our living spaces. These exposures can be from chemicals contained in products that are used in daily life, such as fragrances, personal care and cleaning products, renovation and construction materials, pesticides, solvents, etc. 
Exposures that can initiate or start MCS can be one or more large exposures or long-term chronic low-level exposures at home or at the workplace. This results in sensitization of the individual, causing subsequent exposure to the substance to result in symptoms. Removal of these exposures from the environment of the individual will result in the person being symptom-free. However, if this is not done, constant exposures can provoke an increased number of symptoms in many body systems and can also cause the individual to have stronger reactions or symptoms to lower doses of exposure and to an increased number of unrelated chemicals. Let's find out how many people have a diagnosis of MCS in Canada. As you can see in this table, there is a clear increase in the prevalence from 2015 to 2020. In fact, over the past two decades, prevalence rates have increased and the number of diagnosed cases have more than doubled over a 16 year period, reaching over 1.1 million in Canada by 2020. Of this number, 72% are women and close to half are over the age of 55. There is no infrastructure in place to support, heal, care for, protect, and provide justice for, this, for people who experience the disability of MCS. In Atlantic Canada, the prevalence rates of diagnosed cases of MCS show that approximately five to 7% of the population is affected, with the majority of those affected being women, that is between 64 and 73%. Despite its increasing prevalence, MCS continues to be overlooked and underserved in our society. Limited training among medical professionals and a lack of societal awareness contribute to this neglect. Yet the rates of MCS are skyrocketing, underscoring the urgent need for action. The effects of poor indoor air quality extend beyond MCS, affecting a wide range of chronic conditions, including asthma, COPD, migraines, and autism. And the same chemicals implicated in triggering MCS also contribute to environmental pollution and exacerbate climate change, posing a threat to all of us. But when we compare the funding allocated to other chronic conditions with the negl negligible resources directed towards MCS, the disparity is staggering. For example, for the over 800,000 800, diagnosed cases in 2010, one cent was spent on each patient with MCS. In Canada, MCS is recognized as a disability by the Canadian Commission, Canadian Commission of Human Rights. To understand the implications of recognizing MCS as a disability, we need to explore the social model of disability. Unlike the medical model, which views disability as a personal deficit or impairment, the social model of disability shifts the focus to the environment and societal barriers that create barriers for individuals with disabilities. In other words, it's not the individual's impairment that disables them, but rather the physical, social, and attitudinal barriers present in society. Factors such as exposure to harmful chemicals and everyday products inadequate accommodations in public spaces and lack of understanding and support from society can all contribute to the disabling effects of MCS. Therefore, addressing MCS as a disability requires a broader approach that focuses on changing the environment and eliminating barriers that hinder the full inclusion of individuals with MCS in our society. In our daily lives, we often under, underestimate the significance of our choices. However, each decision we make, no matter how small it may seem, holds the power to create ripples of change. This is especially true when it comes to the products we choose. By consciously opting for healthier alternatives, we not only improve our own well-being, but also contribute to the collective health of our communities. Embracing healthier products isn't just about personal preference. It's about recognizing our roles as agents of change in creating a healthier world for ourselves and future generations. Each choice we make reflects our values and sends a powerful message to businesses and policymakers. 
The importance of clear labeling in product choice cannot be overstated. The ambiguity surrounding product labels poses a significant challenge for consumers seeking to make healthier choices. Greenwashing is a misleading marketing practice where companies try to portray their products as eco-friendly through colors or logos, even if they're not. This can have dire consequences for people living with MCS who might unknowingly expose themselves to triggering substances. Transparent labeling provides crucial information about ingredients and any potential allergens or toxins present in a product, allowing them to safely avoid triggers. Transparent labeling can lead to informed decision-making by choosing products free from fragrance, VOCs, and other harmful chemicals. Being able to spot misleading terms can empower individuals to make in informed product choices. For example, the terms scent-free and fragrance-free might seem si uh, similar, but there is a critical difference. Scent-free can contain a masking agent, that is an additional chemical to mask the fragrance, but the product still contains the same harmful ingredients that can trigger adverse reactions in people with MCS, other health conditions and disabilities. Consider the consequences for those who are providing scent-free accommodations through product choices. Despite their good intentions, these efforts will be ineffective and even harmful due to a lack of transparent labeling. And this can perpetuate the stigma, bias, hardship, and lead to increased inaccessibility and inclusion for people living with MCS. Here are some reliable eco logos to guide your product choices. However, it is always necessary to scrutinize labels to be sure they are genu genuinely free from perfumes and fragrances. It's also important to make it a habit to read labels each time you purchase a product, even if you've bought it before, as manufacturers can alter, alter the contents without prior notice or notification on the product. Now let us look at some practical strategies for creating healthier indoor environments with a focus on inclusion and accessibility for people with disabilities who need access to the built environment and depend on good, a good indoor air quality. Choose fragrance-free products, that is opt for fragrance-free alternatives for personal care products, cleaning supplies, and household items. Fragrances often contain VOCs that can trigger or worsen MCS symptoms. Use zero to low VOC products. Consider using zero to low VOC alternatives for common household items such as paints, adhesives, furniture, etc. Proper ventilation and air circulation will ensure a reduction of indoor air pollution, pollutants. Open windows to allow fresh air to circulate and invest in exhaust fans for or air purifiers. However, it is important to remember that source control through appropriate product choice is most important. Also, consider installing air purif purification systems equipped with HEPA filters, activated carbon filters to effectively remove pollutants from indoor air. And create safe spaces at home. And this includes removing sources of chemical exposure such as scented candles, air fresheners, and being mindful of all product choices that are used in your indoor spaces. And some accommodations um, for people with, for, with MCS can include businesses that could play, play a pivotal role in addressing the needs of individuals with MCS and ensuring equal access to employment opportunities. Implementing a fragrance-free policy in the workplace is one crucial step in promoting better indoor air quality and preventing triggers for MCS individuals. Specific accommodations for MCS individuals vary depend on, depending on symptoms and severity. Examples including, include using fragrance-free and least toxic products, carpet-free workspaces, providing air filtration systems, and arranging flexible, flexible work arrangements. Policymakers play a vital role in supporting initiatives aimed at addressing the needs of people with MCS and promoting healthier indoor environments. Advocating for improved labeling regulations is crucial. Clear and accurate labeling 
helps consumers, including those with MCS, and for those providing accommodation for people with MCS to make informed choices about the products they use. This includes advocating for regulations that require full ingredient disclosure and the identification of potential allergens, sensitizers, irritants, hormone disruptors, carcinogens, etc. Supporting research on MCS and indoor air quality is essential for advancing our understanding of the condition and the need to develop and educate on effective strategies for prevention and management. Policymakers can take concrete steps to support these efforts by allocating funding and resources for MCS research and studies aimed at better understanding the relationship between environmental exposures and health outcomes. As urgent as these efforts are, we simply can't wait for legislation, legislative action. Time is of the essence and the power lies in our choices. It is our decisions as consumers that ultimately shape the market. We hold the key to driving, to driving demand for safer, more transparent products. We must act decisively and promptly to protect the health and well-being of all individuals with MCS and to create healthier living environments for all. As we reflect on the challenges faced by individuals living with MCS, and the complexities of navigating indoor environments, it's essential to acknowledge the progress that has been made in raising awareness and advocating for inclusivity. Despite the barriers faced, there is reason for optimism. Through community organizing and the tireless efforts of advocates, MCS has gained visibility on both local and global scales. As a result, more people are becoming educated about the condition and the importance of creating safe and accessible indoor air spaces. In this journey towards inclusivity, each of us has a role to play, whether it's making a conscious choice in our product selection, supporting businesses that prioritize fragrance-free environments, or advocating for policy reforms that protect the rights of individuals with MCS, every action matters. Let us leave today's presentation inspired to take action in our own lives and communities. Let us commit to making tangible contributions towards building a more inclusive and accessible world for those living with MCS and other conditions that depend on healthy air free of barriers. With collective effort, we can turn hope into reality and create a brighter future for generations to come. We invite you to visit and share our ecolivingguide.ca. We also have a survey on the guide, which we invite you to partake in to let us know how we can do better. Thank you. And I'm ready to take any questions, if there are any questions. Thank you so much. Do we have some questions in the room here? Do we have any on chat, Dusty? No? Okay, I guess you were very concise. You got it all covered. We're all good. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Um, we appreciate that very much. And we'll send you out your thank you as well. So thank you again to Rohini. I'd like to introduce you to Melanie Langeal. 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 I always say Langeal. Everybody does. <laughs> Melanie is an environmental scientist with a technical background in human health risk assessment and subject matter expert in air quality. In her role as CEO of NB Lung, Melanie's priorities are bridging, bridging the silos between environmental science and human health with particular emphasis to those most vulnerable to hazards in the air and developing multidisciplinary cross-jurisdictional partnerships to protect the air we share. And she's also really good on the news and getting interviewed. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like CBC has a direct line to her. It's like, okay, this happened. Let's call Melanie. I'm driving home from work. Oh, there's Melanie again. <laughs> so with that, uh, Melanie's going to do a wrap up and talk a little bit about working together to protect the air we share. And so I'd like to introduce my CEO and president, Melanie Langeal. <laughs> Thanks. 
I'm going to keep it really brief because we've had a long day with a lot of really technical content and my brain is full and I'm, I'm sure you folks are, are feeling the same boat. There is more chocolate cake at the back. Um, feel free to grab another one. No one will judge. I think they were cut in half for modesty, but really you could have like three. There's lots. <laughs> um, big round of applause for Sarah for the work she put into putting together today. Amazing. And thank you so much to all of our speakers who have contributed your expertise to this um, roundtable discussion today. And a big thank you to Health Canada for funding today's event. And for those that aren't familiar with MB Long, we're a provincial charity. Uh, we've been in New Brunswick since 1933, uh, working towards um, better lung health for all. We started in response to the tuberculosis pandemic and have just kept evolving as the threats to lung health have evolved. Is Lacey still here? Yeah. Lacey is um, a counterpart at Lung and SPEI, and we work really collaboratively across the, the Atlantic region. Um, Lung and SPEI had put on this event in the last couple of years, and they graciously... Uh, pass the baton over to us because really um, the intersection between air quality and health is is an area of focus for MB Lung and has been for many years. Um, so we work at the intersection of in environment and health and in the community involvement aspect. So we are trying to take the information that you wonderful researchers are doing at such a technical level and implementing into policy and we're trying to drill it down into individual behaviors at the community level. So I just want to share a couple of stories about how some of the work that you do um, on the policy side and the research side has really affected some of the communities um, that I've worked with. So this will be specific to, uh, <coughs> to New Brunswick. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so one of the programs that we worked with in the last couple of years um, has been with the Purple Air Sensor. So I've heard them pop up a couple of times through the talks today. So we had uh, a pilot program that was funded by ECCC a few years ago where we were ground truthing those sensors. Thank you, Sarah. Um, across the province and getting them in the hands of citizen scientists. Um, so we worked for a couple of years with different programs, you know, with Celine's group up in Ottawa and also um, Andrew and Lacey, they have ducked out. But you know, with them also as well, um, with engaging individuals in hosting these, these sensors own property um, and uh, collecting some contextual data. So we would be watching the sensors and a colleague would open up the, the screen every morning and say, what's going on, what's going on in this area? And we'd call up people and they'd say, oh, my neighbor is burning again and they burn the, the, the dirtiest stuff in their chimney and it's just billowing out. So we were able to provide that contextual data that helps with the modeling as well. But one thing that came out of that was we densified the network of PM 2.5 across the province. So we had, we've got six NAP stations in New Brunswick, and I think we're up to about 40 purple airs to complement that, um, and growing all the time, because it seems that we bring this information in front of people and they say, oh, what? This is like making the invisible visible. And people find it really, really interesting and engaging. But what was really great about that program is that we had a smoke event a couple of years ago, nothing like what was in Nova Scotia here this past year, but that smoke was moving across the province from Quebec and the forecasts were actually able to use our sensor network to really dial in the health messaging and, and the, uh, the special air quality statements in our province. That was really, really exciting. So that's, that's an example of research and policy being implemented right down to the local level so individuals are able to make better decisions about their day-to-day -day activities based on the air quality and the air they're breathing. Another program that we're super excited about is just, just in its infancy and um, is... Um, is our community-based programs for radon awareness. So we've talked a lot about radon today, and thanks, Darren, for your great talk this morning. Um, but we've been bringing this information into the communities, and we've been finding community champions. So uh, in the town of Havelock, which I don't know how many houses are in Havelock. You guys remember, like 600 maybe? <laughs> tiny, tiny community. Um, so we, we've been selling home test kits of radon for, for years and years. but um, as my colleague was putting together these orders, said, what's going on in Havelock? We're getting all these orders <laughs> into this tiny community. Call the person up and come to find out one of the members of the community had been given a lung cancer diagnosis, advanced stage, never ever smoked in her life. She knew about radon as a lung cancer risk based on some of the community work that we had done years before. 
So she had a uh, mitigator come out and do some testing in her home, and it's like off the charts. So she starts knocking on her neighbor's doors. My house is really high on radon. I'm dying of lung cancer. I want you to test your house too. And being such a small and tight knit community, everybody was buying radon test kits. It was wild. Um, but once we caught wind of it, we said, well, how can we help? So we, uh, we established a community radon testing drive. And so our friends at RPC came out, they helped us, and Health Canada as well. And we tested almost every home in the community of Havelock. That was just in November. Data's not in yet, but it's going to start rolling in soon. You know? um, and then we've been able to replicate that. So just last week, we were out in the community of St. Andrews, which has 1,600 residents. Um, and Health Canada provided testing kits there. We, did, we tested 400 homes for radon. Um, so this awareness is growing, and it's through this very community-based action that's happening. And so we're seeing people understand the science in a way that they hadn't before and seeing the implication on their, on their individual lives. It's just so exciting. Another program that we do, again, it's bringing that, that research into policy and into individual action. You know, we, we heard um, Thomas earlier talking about the electric school bus work. Uh, Elise has been working a lot in, uh, in EV outreach and education over the last few years in partnership with Next Ride out there. Um, and because we bring that health lens, to the conversation, we have absolutely no commercial interest. I don't care what car you buy. Um, but this awareness has grown over the last couple of years, and so more and more people are understanding that the, that individual choice that they make and how they get from point A to point B affects the air that we share. So I'll wrap up just by saying, continue the amazing work that you're doing and know that it has a lot of implications and it comes from, you know, from research, into policy and the community action as well. What you do matters, and we are definitely better together. And I hope some of the conversations that you've had around the table today will spark some new partnerships and some new synergies across our organizations. <coughs> and I don't know when my voice is going, but. <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. I'll pass it back over to Sarah for some closing remarks, but thank you so much for spending your day with us. Thanks, Melanie. Um, and with that, it pretty much wraps up what we're doing. Please remember to take your swag and your folders and information. If there's anybody who is speaking and you need contact information, if they're here, get it from them. If you want any of the presentations sent to you after, um, you can email me because people are sending them to me. And we have recorded in, in due time. It will be split up into sections because there are people who wanted to attend but couldn't and there were specific points of interest so we're hoping to share that with them. Don't forget your evaluation forms. Feel free to hang around till 445 and have some more food with us. And with that, thank you very much. That wraps it up. Have a good night. Safe travels.